flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Public comments. Members of the public are invited to address the authority regarding any item that is not listed on the agenda. Is there anyone wishing to speak on items that are not on the agenda? Okay, moving to item 1.1, development of a transportation expender plan, consideration of authority board meetings and action items. Good evening, Authority Board. My name is Tim Hale, the Deputy Executive Director for Projects, and I'm here to discuss the proposed work plan and special authority, proposed special authority board meetings for development of a proposed new transportation expenditure plan. At the May 15th, 2019 Authority Board meeting, the Authority approved the guiding principles and work plan for the development of a new TEP and directed staff to undertake activities towards a new TEP that could be placed on the March 3rd, 2020 ballot. So the work plan outlined the following process, that the authority board would consider and develop an initial draft TEP by June 19th, 2019. And it would circulate the initial draft TEP to the public stakeholders, RTPCs, and then seek approval of the final proposed TEP on August 21st. The city, count, the city towns and, and county would approve or circulate the initial draft DEP during September, October and approve it October 21st or by October 21st. So a more detailed sequence of activities with the reference of authority authorizing California code section is included in attachment A, sample schedule for adopting a district tax for the March 3rd, 2020 selection. And the County Board of Supervisors would approve the ordinance and place the final TE ballot by November 19th, and the County Board of Supervisors would consolidate the election by December 6th to, in order to place the, the measure on the ballot for March 3rd, 2020. The Authority Board has determined that it would like to approve a new TEP as a committee of a whole, and currently the Authority Board holds its regularly scheduled monthly board meetings. Staff believes that the additional authority board meetings are warranted to achieve a transparent process to develop a various sections of a new proposed TEP. A proposed schedule of authority special board meetings and, to and topics is attached in your packet under attachment B. And staff is proposing two special authority board meetings in June, leading up to the consideration and authorization of the proposed initial draft TEP to be circulated to the RTPCs, the stakeholders and public for comment and input on, by June 19th, or on June 19th. During that time, staff will also discuss the perform, performance metrics and analysis of the TEP. And after June 19th, the authority will begin the outreach process we'll hear more about in the following agenda item. And staff is proposing to hold two special authority meetings in July to continue the discussion on the initial draft TEP and a meeting to discuss and report back feedback and input from the public, stakeholders, cities, towns, through the PMA and RTPCs to receive to date during the outreach process, as well as any possible changes to be included in a final TEP. Staff is proposing three special authority board meetings in August to receive the feedback from the RTPCs, the cities, the towns, through PMAs, stakeholders, the public, and discuss and consider any proposed revisions to the initial draft TEP and develop the proposed final TEP, which is targeted by August 21st. So on August 21st, the Authority Board would consider and authorize the final TEP for circulation to the cities and towns and County Board of Supervisors for approval, and staff is proposing a special Authority Board meeting in September 18th to provide an update on the approvals received to date by the cities, towns, and counties. In October, staff is proposing two special Authority Board meetings to continue to provide an update on the TEP approval process and begin the discussion on developing the draft ordinance and resolution to approve the TEP and asking the County Board of Supervisors to call the election. On October 30th, the Authority Board, at a special meeting, would consider the final TEP 
adopt the tax ordinance and, re and resolution. Additional special authority board meetings may be required pending the discussion and outcomes of all of these proposed meetings and staff is seeking approval of the proposed authority board TEP calendar specifically with the proposed additional special authority board meetings of June 12th, June 19th, July 10th, July 17th, August 7th, August 14th, August 21st, September 18th, October 16th, and October 30th. Staff further seeks comments on the proposed meeting dates and outline of proposed topics for the authority board special meetings relative to the development of a new proposed TEP. And I'm ready to take any questions. Questions? I don't have any questions and doesn't look like any of the commissioners does. So I don't know if the public. Right, I do, I do have a, I do have a speaker card. Okay. So, uh, Second the motion, so it's on yes. The table. Okay, Glover, I'll move it. You She's moved seconded. it. So we have a second. You okay, Terry Ann? Yes. Got it. Glover, right, that's what I thought. Glover, Mitchell, and then Mitchell, first and a second. Okay, and I do have a speaker request uh, from Bob Allen. And this is the only speaker card I have on this topic. Good evening, members of the board. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak. Let's make sure it's on. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Red is on. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm Bob Allen with Urban Habitat. We were one of the members of the stakeholder advisory group in the 2016 Measure X process. Um, yeah, I was expecting more discussion, so I guess I'll go right into it. Um, uh, I'll pass around a letter from a group of about 10 of the folks who were on the stakeholder committee um, last time signed quickly tonight because um, the process is moving fast, as you all know, and um, we're trying to catch up. So hopefully there's no, no typos in here. Just to, to summarize, um, several of us were involved uh, last couple of years in San Mateo with the Measure W process, which we think was very successful, a really good model, but still squeaked by, um, showing how difficult you know, even in good economic times, these measures can be to pass. Um, and I think it really bodes well, based on what we learned from the Measure W process, to have a really robust public process, but also an investment package that the voters will approve. And so in the letter, we've commented on the last staff report really quickly um, around the engagement process. We hope that in the statement in the, the packet was that you would do at least one meeting sub-regionally um, you know, in each subregion, rather in the county, we hope you'll consider doing the additional meetings that you talked about there to actually engage folks. And we have some other suggestions in there, um, comments in here about performance metrics, and hope that we can have an outcomes-based approach to the project and program selections. Um, you know, uh, happy to see uh, language in there around housing and some uh, connections to housing and transportation. We have suggestions to look at MTC's housing incentive program and go further, as well as um, community stabilization and other kinds of impacts from investments. Protecting and strengthening the urban limit line, there's a lot of great pieces in there. We have a different, probably, vision of the pie. I know we, we don't want to jump ahead into that, but that's usually what these come down to in terms of how much we're able to do in terms of transportation, uh, both local transit, um, regional transit, and active transportation. So, um, you know, we're looking at it's something we hope that will be, you know, well above 50 or 60 percent of the measure. And um, again, that's all in the letter here. Just to say, I, I've been out talking to some groups um, in the last couple of weeks who are not part of the traditional transportation network in Antioch, Pittsburgh, and a few places. And folks are interested in getting involved, but I think the speed of the process is a little bit of a challenge. So I expect more folks to be able to get out to the meetings now that we have the full schedule. And I think folks are interested, but hopefully that we can run a process that's meaningful that will get folks on board to actually pass the measure. Um, and that's about the substance, but it's about the process and the engagement piece. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other speakers? Okay. We do have a first and a second. Is there any more discussion? I just, okay. I just had a comment. I'm absolutely in support of the schedule and I think it's, it's very aggressive, but with all of us, doing all the lifting, we can make that happen. I also realize that not all of us are going to make every single meeting. 
there are such things as vacations that are pre-planned that some of us will miss a meeting here or there. But I'm going to rely on all of us to carry the ball together. So um, we're rolling up our sleeves and off we go. Okay, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimously. Did you get that, Mom? Thank you. All right, 1.2, development of transportation expenditure plan, proposed public information and outreach plan. Lindsay. Good evening, commissioners. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the warrior score, so if anyone else <laughs> currently has it and wants to share it before I begin, feel free. <laughs> um, I, will, I will try to keep this brief. So um, this evening, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the proposed public outreach and information process, primarily geared towards that far right-hand bucket, the, the general public, um, not specifically stakeholders, or other um, groups that have traditionally been involved, but just kind of how we're going to reach out to the public at large about the transportation expenditure plan process. As you may recall, you approved at your May meeting about $700,000 um, to aid in this effort. So this evening I'm going to share with you how we propose to spend those dollars. Um, just a quick reminder, this is the schedule we're aiming to have a proposed kind of final draft TEP to circulate to the cities and the county by August 21st, so a mere three months from now. And if you had to decide how you were going to spend the summer and these were your options, public meetings or summertime fun in Contra Costa County, I could probably guess how many folks in the county um, would respond to that. So I just think it's important that we be realistic. As Commissioner Pierce mentioned, many folks have vacations planned and we're going to do our best to have a really robust public engagement and outreach process, but it is taking place during the summer where a lot of people um, have other activities or, or prearranged items. These are the general overall goals of the proposed public information outreach plan. We're going to try to you know, continue to engage with folks who are very interested in our work and want to be part of the process. We're going to work really hard to expand our efforts to reach a little deeper into the community, um, which was some of the suggestions from the speakers at the previous meeting and which I think you just heard from Mr. Allen, um, and do our best to kind of educate folks about the process, why, why we are developing a new transportation expenditure plan. So these are some of the tools that we're proposing to use. Um, we hosted telephone town halls in 2015, and they were a really great way to reach a lot of people um, who had the opportunity to listen from their homes while in transit. They could just passively listen to um, the information that was being given. Um, we also did some in-call polling, and folks had the opportunity to ask questions live from some of our commissioners and staff members to get their questions answered directly. So we're proposing to do those again, um, five this time, at least one in coordination with each RTPC, Regional Transportation Planning Committee, um, to specifically address the needs of those areas. Um, we're also proposing that we simulcast all of the calls in Spanish this time, which is something we didn't do before. We will be giving an, given an audio recording and a written translation as well. Um, we are also proposing to host community meetings and staff events um, in each part of the county. At this point in time, you'll see it says we're planning to host at least one. Obviously, we're hoping to meet exceed that, um, but I'm just trying to be conservative given that there are also um, a number of Fourth of July events, farmers market types events that we're also going to try to reach out to. Um, we're proposing that we also host these community meetings not as standalone meetings from the Contra Costa Transportation Authority, but in partnership with local community-based organizations or groups to maybe reach some communities that haven't traditionally been part of the process or may not be following our work um, as closely as other groups. Um, we're also proposing to create an online engagement tool um, and probably a companion printed survey piece. These, this is an example of what we did in 2015 with the Cocoa Coins 
Um, we will be creating something new. I just wanted to have a pretty picture to show you this evening. We're not going to resurrect that one. Um, this is a great way for folks to kind of weigh in on different elements or pieces of the plan at their own convenience. Um, online, it will be mobile friendly, um, or for those who don't um, want to get online or don't have access, we will also have um, something they can do in paper format that you can also take with you to events if you'd like. The TEP will likely be a pretty long document. Um, my guess is it's going to net out somewhere around 30 pages, just if I had to wager a guess. Um, so we have to let folks know that it exists. Um, we have to let them know that we want their opinion. And we have to make that content digestible for them in some way, shape, or form. Not everyone is going to want to read 30 pages. So here's just a few examples of types of things um, we may do to help get that information out to different audiences, such as cities. Um, we may do fact sheets, presentations, stakeholder toolkits, some sort of animated GIFs like you see moving back and forth on the screen that can be used in newsletters and social medias and by our stakeholders as well. We're also going to update all of our communication tools just to make sure that we are um, promoting the fact that this process is happening and we're seeking input across all of our channels, our website, social media, the presentations we do in the community um, to really kind of make sure that this is front and center uh, this entire summer. And of course, we're going to encourage people to come and give you their public comment. Um, while we have all these great tools that we're putting together, there really is no substitution um, for you hearing directly from the public what they want, and that's probably um, more relevant input to you than what somebody may type into a computer. So we will always be encouraging folks to attend in person. Um, this is pretty hard to read on this screen. I know that. It's the exact same table you have in your packet that went out, the budget table. I just wanted to point out here um, that, you know, off the top of that $700,000 budget, 230000 of that is actually dedicated to developing the TEP document. And that means writing it, revising the sections, um, changing the words, changing the headings, new photographs. And if the board decides to move forward with putting the TEP on the ballot, this budget will also support creating a ballot-friendly version and doing the Spanish and Chinese translations. So I just wanted to explain what that was, and hopefully the rest are fairly self-explanatory. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm looking at that, and I see uh, updating the authorities' communication channels. Are those the things you were just talking about? relative to uh, new tools to be using. I just want to make sure that we're clear that we're not updating the authorities' communication channels and using the money for what we – normal administration. This is for special for what you just mentioned. Correct. This Thank would be like creating a new section for the transportation expenditure plan on the website, that sort of thing. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I had one. Um, last time we um, did kind of an online survey, how would people spend their Contra Costa tokens if they had a chance? Are we talking about maybe offering some open-ended offer opportunities to just get things off their chest about what, you know, their ideas might be? Yes. Because I'm getting a few of those on the street, and that might be really helpful to be able to direct them to a repository so we make sure they all get recorded. Yes. We actually did two iterations of an online tool last time, and the, the first go around we kind of said, share your bright ideas, and that will definitely be a component of this tool because I think it's really important to find out, is there is there anything that we've missed in the plan? You're done? Okay. No? Um, thank you. Uh, what do you think we can do, though, to um, um, get more people engaged? Uh, because the fact is, when you really look at the numbers, um, you know, it's it's almost like a contest. People sitting out here with their special interests say, I've got more people on my side. We represent the public. 
uh, as a whole to make the best decisions about our mission, which is um, improving transportation. Uh, but we don't get a lot of people um, involved in these. And yeah, statistically, it, it makes sense. As I said, you know, my mother was in that business for 30 years. But when it comes to an online survey like that, which isn't as controlled, um, what can we do differently? And what are the ideas of, that maybe you and our consultants have proposed to really reach out to other people, to get them to spend that few minutes? And for example, um, City of San Ramon did a really good survey about park use. And surprisingly, they got a huge number of people. And you'd get an email, and it would say, hey, we'd like you to take the survey. And then if you didn't do it, you got another one. And it just went on, and we don't have a long time to do this, but it went on at a robust pace, and they really got great engagement, greater than they ever have before. Um, so what are we thinking of some new ways to engage people? It's no use having a, a great online survey if nobody knows it exists, right? right? So I, I think some of the things that we're, we're looking at to help make it easy for people to participate, in addition to just um, getting the word out through possibly postcards showing people all of the ways they can participate, um, including the online survey and attending meetings and that sort of thing. Um, what we've been kicking around is um, when we go to certain types of community events, so I'll just use a farmer's market as an example, of being able to bring iPads or some other means where someone can take that survey right there while they're thinking about it or have a business card that they can take with them with the link and other information so they can do it at their leisure if they don't want to do it at that point in time. We're also looking at um, potentially using some peer-to-peer -peer texting to offer people, you know, you would get a text essentially that would offer you the opportunity to take the survey right there on your mobile phone. Um, and we're potentially looking at some sort of kind of uh, different ways of reaching different populations, whether that's advertising on BART, um, not just general online advertising, but trying to be sure that we uh, target places where people are using the transportation system. So I, I think those sound great. Those are kind of, to be honest, those are kind of the, the things we're used to seeing. Um, I thought what I might hear is that we're actually going to get a um, cell phone contact list a email list, which we can buy, because we can do that as individuals and campaign and reach any specific group of people we want. It's a fairly inexpensive thing, but um, it needs to be robust. It's got to, it, you know, getting somebody to advertise it, if it shows up in your phone, either in email or on text, text says, just touch this, you can do a quick five minute survey. We're going to get a lot of responses. So. I think it would behoove us to um, look into those. And again, whatever profile, whatever demographic, any criteria you want, that's out there. And those databases are really, really good. They're well tested. Um, so I would hope, or as a suggestion, that part of this we could um, use those companies that will um, take our information, put it out to their list, or we buy those lists to do it. However, we could do that. But I think that would get us to the engagement level. Because truthfully, we need that. You know, I sort of sense with the, the short period of time what's going to happen is, again, the room's going to fill up with every special interest. And we're going to end up with a watered-down process that isn't going to make any difference. We make a lot, make certain groups happy, but to our voters and to our constituents who want to make their commute better, if we don't just do that and, and have laser focused on that, we're wasting our time. And I'm just worried that... We don't get that engagement, which is to support the goals and everything we want to achieve. Then, um, just a little concern. So, anyway, food for thought. Thank you. I've got to ask something. Is there any way, following what Neil said, that we send out a a blurb to the, whatever numbers we get on the cell phone? I was just in Tennessee, and they sent out a blast on everybody's cell phone. And the whole restaurant, I found out how connected we are. If you were eating, we were eating breakfast, the place is full. You should have heard the whole place exploded because something went off on everybody's phone. At the same time. And there wasn't a soul in there that didn't read it, including me. But, well, wait a minute. You read a text, you never read mine. 
<laughs> we won't okay. go there. Okay. But I did read it. So I don't know if that, that can be done, but it sure it sure got, uh, you know, I don't know. Just, just a question. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Was it an emergency message, though? Yeah, Usually they can only do that on an emergency. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, getting, if there's something, it's a thought. Yes. All right. Is there any? Yes, sir. And just a question. Are we going to be doing anything more up in the communities in which the measure failed last time? I think this... This board has always been very big on making sure that we reach every community. So I think our, our goal is to be sure that we touch every corner of the county. But um, in some corners, we need to touch twice. So <laughs> noted. Uh, noted. Yeah. East County. County. <laughs> no, it's us. Yeah. Um, you know, I found out that that um, about half the households in my city are on next door. And the city has access to every neighborhood. So, uh, you know, the police department, the mayor's office, we, we can send out a, a next door uh, post that'll hit 20, over 20,000 people. And um, that's, that's probably the biggest, quickest way of getting in touch with the most people, at least where I am, than anything else I know. Um, the county uh, is engaging in the census, and so I don't know, um, Supervisor Burgess is the chair of that committee, but they are doing outreach, obviously, to a lot of different people. So I think all these are great ideas. I think we have to look at everywhere we can get it in. So um, if you need contact information, Federal or I would be happy to get that for you. Or John Cunningham's in the office. He can make a note of it. Um, how to because they're going to be going out uh, I know in each district we're doing some convenings I believe but there's going to be more and in addition the county's redoing its general plan we're going out into the community so we can take out a lot of stuff um, I know each member of the board has an email list that we're happy to do what we call e-blasts and I'm sure each of you have different ways or your city does but um, I would I like the next door I just know that Supervisor Joya was trying to get the county to have access to all the next doors and we found out we couldn't do it so you may have to do it city by city uh, but these are all great ideas that I know you're taking back and going we already did that we already did that we already <laughs> thought of that but anyway I just wanted to mention those two things the general plan and the the uh, census that we're working on all right I'd move oh. the item it's already been moved oh, second. I'll move. let's move it though with the comments we've had to incorporate these all right, do we know who moved the item? Federal. Federal, you moved the item? I think. That was on the last one. That was on the last one. Yeah. But I was glad to I don't think, I don't think anybody. Okay, you'll I'll second it. I'll second it. Uh, Newell, Newell, I do not have any speaker cards on this item. If anybody wishes to speak. Okay. I, Newell moved it? Aye. Item one three, transportation funding and needs. While we're waiting, do we know a, a warrior's score? 
They're down by 10. They're down by 10. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, authority members. My name is Isham Noemi. I'll be presenting this item. Uh, since November 2016, uh, three new revenue sources became available for transportation purposes. And one might ask, why do we need more money? So I'm going to try to answer this question. In my presentation, I have a few slides, and there is a large handout it's just a reproduction of what you have in attachment A in your packet. So I'm going to start with a, a brief uh, overview of the new revenue sources. And they are uh, Senate Bill 1, SB 1, also known as uh, the RMRA, I think, Road Maintenance Rehab Act. And then uh, Regional Measure 3 and uh, BART's Measure RR. Starting with SB1, uh, SB1 provided significant funding for street maintenance, uh, approximately $1.5 billion out of the $5 billion uh, that it generates every year statewide goes to the cities and counties uh, in California. Um, the table uh, in this slide shows you the amount that the cities and county get from SB1 when you compare it to what they get from gas taxes as well as what they get from the 18% return source in Measure J. Uh, if you look at the overall number, they get almost twice as much as they get from the 18% return to source. For the smaller cities, uh, for the larger cities, they get more than what they get um, in uh, Measure J. But for the smaller and medium-sized cities, it's about equivalent what they have from Measure J. There is a detailed table in your staff, uh, in the staff report, that shows the amount per city. Uh, SB1 also provides uh, some funding to transit. Uh, some of the funding uh, is competitive, and some of it is based on formula. And uh, this table shows you the numbers uh, they get from the state uh, transit assistance program, uh, how much it increases because of SB1. These are the two columns in the middle in light uh, blue and the amount they currently get from Measure J. For the smaller operators, uh, you know, Measure J amount is still more than what they get from SB1, but for the larger operator like AC Transit and BART, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, more than, the amount they get from SB1 is more than what they get from Measure J. And all these numbers are just for one fiscal year, fiscal year 18-19. Uh, it also, SB1 also provided money for pedestrian bicycle projects uh, uh, through the active transportation program. However, it's highly competitive. And I'm sad to say that in the last uh, call for projects, in the last cycle of the ATP, only a couple projects in the whole Bay Area got funded out of that, and none of them were in Contra Costa. So it, it's, it's very competitive. It favors disadvantaged area. And... Uh, you know, it's highly unpredictable uh, of how much you can get from that fund source. And then there are the major capital projects categories in SB1. There are multiple uh, categories. They're, they're competitive, all of them. They're listed on this slide. Uh, they have restrictions on the type of projects you, that can apply. For example, the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program only freight type of projects can apply for that source. And in Contra Costa, only I-80 is on the freight network. Uh, so only projects on I-680 uh, will be eligible to apply. And there is a 30% match if uh, someone applies that's not Caltrans. Uh, the same, uh, I can say the same about the, some of the other categories. For example, the solutions for congested corridors only MTC and Caltrans can apply. CCTA cannot apply on their own for this fund source. 
and you know it favors projects that have uh, matching funds. Uh, the local partnership program, we were fortunate a year ago uh, in getting $33 million uh, for the 684 interchange out of this source, uh, but one-to-one -one match is required. If it wasn't for our Measure J funds, we would probably not have been qualified to apply for this. And uh, so for the future, not only the match is required, there will be a lot of competition for this, and uh, it's still highly unpredictable as well. The only guaranteed fund we get from SB1 is the formulaic funds uh, from the local partnership program. Uh, right now, uh, it's about 2.3 million per year, and we've used it the last three years on uh, 684 to augment the funding on that, as well as Innovate 680. So that, that was the SB1 funding. Uh, Quickly to go through the RM3 funding, you, you worked very hard in increasing our share in RM3 over the past uh, year or so. Uh, right now, out of the RM3, remember SB1 is five billion a year statewide. RM3 is expected to generate over its life five billion dollars, so it's substantially smaller amount. It raised the tolls on the bridges three dollars uh, to be carried out over. Uh, 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 various uh, over five years basically or six years and these are the list of projects in Contra Costa that actually got had funding in ARM3. I have to say that's great it's going to help move these projects forward but it does not fully fund them. Uh, you still need other fund source to fully fund these to fully fund these projects. Uh, I want to also say note that there are opportunities in ARM3 that allows us that may allow us to get additional funding, like the express lane category, the Bay Trail, safe routes to transit, and the North Bay transit access improvements. Um, most likely, if you have matching funds or fully funded projects, you will, uh, with this funding, you, you will score higher and you will be more successful in getting those funds. So these are regional categories. Projects throughout the Bay Area will be competing for them. And I also finally want to note in RM3 there was $500 million uh, for BART expansion cars beyond replacing the current fleet. Finally, the last fund source that, uh, uh, that became available is BART's Major RR, which provided funding to replace tracks and upgrade the train control system. Uh, it's a $3.5 billion bond. Uh, it also it has some limited funding, about $135 million for uh, BART station access improvements. So that was the revenues. They uh, came after years of underinvestment in the transportation system. Uh, but are they enough to meet Contra Costa's transportation need? And the answer is no. In, in the next few slides, I will go over what we need to complete uh, some of the priority projects in Contra Costa that improve congestion levels uh, to maintain the pavement at an acceptable level uh, at the cities in the, uh, on the city streets and also to allow us to complete our pedestrian bicycle networks. So I'm going to start with some of the major capital projects, priority projects, and uh, at, uh, if, you, if you recall, at the January workshop, we presented you with a table, uh, which is this table in front of you, um, showing the funding plans for a subset of our high priority projects. This list included projects like Innovate 680, the future phases of 684, Highway 4 oper operational improvements, Transit extension to Brentwood, you know, the second phase of 80 San Pablo Dam Road in West County, and others that have been on the books for, for some time now. So the table basically uh, looked at the project cost, what are the existing fund sources, considering uh, the passage of RM3 and SB1, and uh, uh, determined that there is currently $2.4 billion shortfall on these projects. With uh, over the next 10 
you know, 15 years, we anticipate maybe if we're successful in competing for the different fund sources, including the competitive ones in SB1 or RM RM3, we could get up to $800 million. We're still short $1.6 billion. And this is not an exhaustive list of all the projects in Contra Costa. This is just a subset. So uh, that's, that's one area where we need additional funding. Uh, switching to the pet bike network, uh, the authority pet bike plan that you adopted last year in 2018 estimated the shortfall uh, to complete the network at 1.2 billion. They also estimated that, you know, over the life of the plan, we could get about 800 million from uh, future fund sources and uh, from existing sources such as SB1, RM3, and so on. But even with that, we're still short $0.4 billion. So you add the 0 0.4 to the 1.6, now we're at $2 billion. Uh, in terms of our pavement needs, uh, you know, MTC did an, analys an analysis uh, last year to determine the impact of SB1 funding on the deferred maintenance. Uh, in the different cities, every city uses has a pavement management system, uh, Street Saver. Using that software uh, and the amount of revenue projected to be available from SB1, the other sources, the deferred main, the ten-year deferred maintenance uh, uh, for, will be basically with SB1 with SB1 funding will be reduced from. 1.7 billion to 1.1 billion. That that's really the great news. Uh, however, the bad news: you still have about 1.1 billion in deferred maintenance, so you still need additional funding to eliminate that. And this is to bring the pavement condition index to an acceptable level of 75. So, in summary, if you add the numbers. Uh, we have over three and a half billion dollars in additional uh, money and additional funding that that's needed, and that doesn't count the needs for our transit systems. Uh, we unfortunately at this point don't have these numbers. MTC is working on them with for the RTP, but I'm sure you can assume that it's going to be over a billion dollars. Uh, we do need a local fund source to help us attract some of the new fund sources uh, that I outlined to Contra Costa. As I mentioned, SB1 does require a match. It's highly competitive. RM3 will likely go to projects that can be fully funded with the RM3 money. Uh, without this local fund source, we will have limited success, and our transportation infrastructure in the county, unfortunately, will still be lacking. Um, so I hope I answered the question why why we need more funding, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Questions, comments from staff, from the board. Newell, uh, take a shot. Um, I think there's a higher level view that makes the case better. Um, that was really an analysis that says, uh, here's the project we had, and we need some more money. But what it doesn't talk about is the real problem: is that there were six billion dollars of need for Measure J. And we work backwards. We say all we can do is raise $2 billion, so we'll only do $2 billion. Ignoring the other $4 billion, we're in the mess that we're in, as most of the Bay Area is and California is, is because we have these limits on how we can get dedicated money. And unfortunately, if we tell that message to our public, <coughs> we're going to lose because it doesn't tell the real story. The real story is... There's, there's in, in this county, probably $20 billion worth of need. And we have to be honest, we can't fund all of that because the system is set up. These are our limitations. And we've got to be honest about that because, and, and we only are putting projects on there that kind of think, well, okay, we have this much time. We're not making the rational decisions because we don't have access to the amount of money it takes to solve the problem. So I think we have to be much clearer, much stronger to say there's billions of dollars with the need. There's a $1.1 billion still shortfall for cities. That would take a third of this measure to do that, just to cover that. 
there is billions of dollars worth of projects that we need to do that we don't have on the list because we figure, well, we can't get the money, so we don't put them on the list. That, that there's, there's a much stronger way to make this message. There's a big problem, and we have to be honest, we're only going to be able to deal with about 10% of it. But we keep limping along in doing this little bit, and our public says, well, I already did a measure. And they're not looking at the details. So we've got to be really clear in this message, really strong, powerful, that says, yes, we can't solve all the problems. Here's what we can do. Here's what it's going to cost, and here's going to be the outcome. And we're going to make these areas better. But I would not present it this way. This won't get us anywhere. Because it doesn't talk about the broad picture and how big of a scale the problem is. And it's an important message for all of us that everybody wants a piece of this. What we're doing is taking a piece of a piece of a piece, to, and we all get down to doing almost nothing. Everybody gets something, but we're not going to do anything. So my concern is, is we're looking backwards and not looking as far forward as we ought to. So that's a comment. Just maybe we can think broader the next time we come over this. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah. well, it was on. It's back on again. Okay. Yeah, it, it, especially in this measure since there's no marquee projects. I mean, there's nothing we're going to be able to point to and say, this is what it's going to get for you. And everybody goes, oh, that's a great idea with something really, really neat. So I think it's really important following up on Newell to say there, there, there is so much out there and they need to be done. We're doing the best we can to stay, in, to stay proactive and stay ahead of this and keep what we have in the shape to, um, to help you move and, and, and mitigate some of the, the traffic flow problems we have out there, and we won't be able to address them all. Uh, yeah, let's not give them a rosy picture. Obviously, that wasn't part of this presentation. That, yeah, go ahead and vote this, and we're going to solve all your problems because we can't. But uh, it, it is important, as Newell said, to point out that there's you know, only so much we can do, but here's what we can do for you. The highest priority is exactly. Yeah. Julie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with both those statements. And I, I go back to what we learned from the poll. And if we can tell people what the outcome of spending this money is, we get a better response. So we need to be able to show how the spending of whatever meager funds we can accumulate will make a difference in their lives. We need to also be able to show how that money will leverage other resources. Because there are other resources out there. There are federal grants. There are other things that's a very competitive program with some of the things at the state. And if we can't show in, that we have the money to help leverage that, we won't get those. Um, we've been really lucky with some of the money we've gotten um, that because we've been ready to go and had a project ready and shovel ready and prepared, that when the opportunity for funding came up, we were successful. Um, and RM3 is never going to be enough. SB1 is never going to be enough. But if we're able to cobble something together and show people that there is a real tangible outcome from some of these things, you're going to hear from every city that they would take it all and it still wouldn't be enough. For each individual city, they're all going to say local return to soils can't be high enough. Well, I'm sorry. I don't agree with that. Um, I, I think, you know, once people can get out of their city, they need to be able to get to where they're going and getting across the county and making it contiguous and making it a smooth flow and making it predictable. Though Those are the things we heard on the, on the polling. So I think we need to find a way to show how what this raises can leverage the other dollars that we need to complete the projects. And we need to make that really simple, maybe on a project by project basis. I'm, I'm trying to visualize graphics and I'm not the artist for that, but it, you know, it can show measure J's here and uh, X2 is here and that leverages X amount of various different pots. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's possible. Maybe it's not. Um, but I think we need to be able to demonstrate how we think this is going to actually get a project finished. 
And then also I'd like to make a comment here. I, you know, we always, there's two words that I've kind of been raised in my life. There's optimism and pessimism. And both those words will influence our lives forever. Some people are very um, pessimistic and the world's going to fall apart every day. But I get up in the morning and I look at pretty much optimism. It's going to be better than it was yesterday because yesterday was pretty bad. <laughs> so, uh, but the idea is with this, when you're, I was in the sales business all my life, and I was taught you would never walk into an account and tell them, I guess you didn't sell anything yesterday, huh? You walk into the account and say, boy, it looks like you sold everything. So it's got to be presentation. And uh, what can we do and how can we pull the optimism out of it? And I agree, you gave a good report. I was crying. It's back out. Oh. And I didn't mean to cry because we're not going to make it. But we all know we're not. The public will also know we can't do everything. But here's what we can do. And, it's, and we are going to, in the long run, be better for it because we will get something done. End of that retreat. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment that as a part of the infrastructure meeting that was held uh, last week with uh, Congressman DeSonia and Congressman Thompson, I think it was articulated throughout the county the need for transportation dollars to build on transportation infrastructure. And I totally agree with Newell, Kevin, and Julie in terms of you know, looking at this problem, you know, one of the things I always look at is when we put times on, on these things, I really think that when we don't do things in perpetuity, we find ourselves going back and rehashing a minimum fix for continuation. When the costs are not going down, they continue to grow and we need more on top of what we already received. So I, I just look at that, and it's something that I really would like us to think about is that, um, you know, while we're thinking about these measures, we really have to make the uh, appeal to the public and allowing them to, to clearly understand. I know timing is short, and it's hard to sell messages, but the public needs to know that this uh, does not get us where we need to go, and that there are some signature projects that's out there that we're looking to, to do, but some way we have to start selling the message in a larger way. Uh, you know, I'll go back and kind of echo the original thoughts that Newell came up with. Um, I, I, I think we're uh, diverting from the goal of having a compelling vision, <clears throat> uh, you know, before we've had the, you know, the fourth bore of the Caldecott Tunnel extend BART to Antioch, you know, these are compelling visions that they're, ra they're rallying cries, you know. And, um, you know, when you, while, while everything in here is right, you know, about, well, we need this funding and we need to match project funds and that kind of thing, um, Remember, our consultants told us to focus on outcomes. And what I keep coming back to, we've had this discussion before, is what do people really care about? And, and my take on it is, is that if you take or want to take public transit, or maybe you ride or ride, walk or ride a bike, we're going to make it cleaner, safer, faster. We're going to get you there quicker or better than, than you've ever seen before. Use alternative means. That, you cutting me off? <laughs> if, if you don't use one of these alternative means, then we're going to get enough people off the road that you can get where you want to go without being in a parking lot, you know? I mean, it seems to me like that's the two things people care about. And, and they are out or we're going to get you on transit cleaner, safer, faster. It's, it's got to be a lot more than that, but, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think 
I, I think we're missing this compelling rallying cry that's going to catch people's imaginations. Two of them really do us any good as far as transportation. RR works for BART, but it doesn't do anything to put to widen roads or, 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 or whatever we need to there. So we focus on those two and say in order to qualify for a lot of those dollars, we need, we're going to need to be able to match. And, 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 and an example of that matching is look at what we did on Highway 4, look what we did out there where it was three to one, if not even more than that three to one that we were able to attract for every dollar we spent we were able to attract three more dollars from some other other entity to help pay for this thing and, and going forward we need to be in that position in this situation in order to make ourselves competitive for open bids uh and and, and to get the necessary dollars and being a self-funding county puts us in a, in a in a different category than everybody else when we go to the table asking for additional dollars out there so we need to, to emphasize a lot of that in that process Karen. Thank you. Um, all great points. Two things have changed since um, since that. Uh, we've uh, defeated taking away the, the gas tax money, and there's RM3. And our constituent, the message is, it's not, what I'm hearing to some extent is we need to show them that we've done great work and here's the projects and we need more money. And I just don't think that resonates anymore with our public. I, I'm not saying we can't pass the measure. I want to be optimistic, Bob, but the message has to be different. You mentioned East County earlier, Kevin. It didn't resonate when we, um, so let's not use that message that we leveraged all these dollars, we didn't use very much, and look at this great project you got because they could care less, unfortunately, or could not care less. Um, so, uh, well. Let's just say they were uninformed of where the dollars came from or who did the project. They had no idea that that money came from Measure J. Well, or, that or may be. I think, I think that's, I, that's what we have to sell the public is, is the great work that we've done in the past. And so they can all look at and, and, and look at these marquee products. That, uh, that we well, I, 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 I know that, but we got to do it a little differently this right. time. Is and and I know Lindsay's going to be working on the messaging, and then once uh, should we move forward, then it moves to the private sector. I just think we need to be real careful not to use the same old rhetoric because it didn't get us where we wanted to. I think we learned a real valuable lesson in November of 2016 about that. And as I said, all of the things everybody has said is great, but we got to make it sexier somehow. And I don't know what that is, uh, but extending BART at Far East County is great for East County residents, but I just come across constituents so much every day, where is it about me? And that's not going to resonate in other parts of the county, and hopefully we'll have other things to do there. We've tried to do that in the past. But going back to outcome-based measurements, um, and, and I made the comment before, I know we don't have the pavement that we want, but people think they've paid for that. I know they haven't. I always say people should take Government Finance 101. I think it's a requirement when I'm in charge of the world so that they understand that just because you paid into this pot doesn't mean this pot got taken care of. But they don't look at it that way. They feel that we're taking too much money and, well, I'm generalizing. Again, I think I've made my point. We've got to make the message sexier. So do we have the message we have to approach it in a different manner? What do you think, John? I, I totally agree, and you'll probably see that in Tim's presentation. Oh, where it'll focus oh. on oh. outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Whoa! <laughs> I just saw bus transportation. Sounds like a uh, I, I do. I do have a request, uh, speaker card on this item 1.3. Debbie, I have no other speaker cards in this topic. 
All right. Good evening, Chair and uh, board members. I'm Debbie Toth with Choice in Aging, Nonprofit of the Year for Assembly District 14. Woo! Um, sorry, that was today. I'm excited. Um, so I just wanted to, I could have, I guess, spoken on this or the next one. Um, just bring your focus back to the fact that it's not just projects, it's programs, and that we should not age out of the ability to get from point A to point B. And that in the last round with the expenditure plan, um, the one single thing that the entire group agreed upon was that we needed to fund accessible transportation more. Um, we have a growing aging demographic you may not know about, but just the portion of the population that's 85 and older from 2010 to 2060 in Contra Costa County is going to grow by 299 percent. And we are ill-equipped to serve that population today. It's going to get worse if we don't address it. So I just want to just keep reminding you that there are programs and people involved, too, and not just roads and streets and bridges and tunnels and barts and things like that. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, can I follow up on something about that? Sure. It, it, we can talk about that aging population, but in the messaging, how you make it relevant to us is those of us who are having to get our parents to places and it takes away from what we've got to do. That's a sexy message like, oh, yeah, I'm inconvenienced because I've got to make sure mom and dad get on this bus and this bus. And so I think... You know, following up on what Debbie said, we are very aware that there's projects in addition or programs in addition to projects. But I just think that's a message that resonates with voters because they're the ones being burdened by those kind of errands. And it it's a they love their folks, um, but it is such a stress. I cannot tell you. You're hearing the voice of, of experience here. I see Mrs. Pierce. Uh, and I know you all had to deal with this. So um, I think that's one way we can get that message. No. Uh, just to add one thing, a little bit on what Karen was just saying, too. Um, that we have two, two other things we have to really keep in mind. That the Bay Area is becoming less and less competitive. Right. Business, business are saying it's too expensive. I can't move goods and services here. Um, it's incumbent upon us that we can try to do all these great things. And if our economy just gets worse and worse and worse and people don't want to live here because they can't get anywhere and you can't do business, I get about, if I have to travel now in the Bay Area, I get half done what I did eight years ago or 10 years ago, even 15 years ago. You just can't get it done in a day. So, and even with all the technology we're embracing, we have to stay laser focused that we have to improve this. Otherwise, our economy, our housing values will start to drop. People won't be working here. Our wages will start. This is about economics. This really is it's about keeping this a competitive place. And you can see examples in other parts of the country, other parts of the world that have invested and done exceptionally well to move those things. And that's their competitive advantage. So while we want to do all of these things, the second thing we have to remember, there's a 14-year overlap, right? We've never had. We've had two measures. We didn't really have the overlap like we have. So we have to look about how we spend money different. Because let's just say if you're going to fund the same program that you've had going because you like the program, all of a sudden you're going to give it this double the amount of money for 14 years and it falls off a cliff. We have to look at that and be realistic. We want to make things get better. So it's balancing making sure this economy stays robust and that this is the value proposition in the world to do business. And we've owned that for a long time. We're getting really close every day to one or one day closer every day that we are not going to be that, that entity to be doing that. And there are too many other places it's easier to do business. So we have a lot of responsibilities, but let's keep in mind there's a 14-year overlap, so I think we can approach things in a lot more creative ways than we did before because we didn't have that. So it may mean that you can keep consistent funding going, carry on that funding, and lift it up to a higher level. Other, other ways to do things. So um, just food for thought. Hopefully Tim Hale is making some notes. Um, we would... Um, just, it's, it's just an FYI information. Got it. All right. I think we need, um, we need, we, 
Could you even speak oh. to Parker on that? Yes, if I could, I just, I just don't want this left out. You know, while we continue to talk about economic growth, we need to really see how we incentivize employment here locally. So jobs, 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 and more jobs here within our region is going to be so important because we, that gets people out of the car. It gets people looking at connecting to transit systems. And so while other people or looking at housing and what have you, we need to be looking at jobs. Okay, this was just informational, am I correct? No action needs to be taken. We shall now approve, we'll uh, go forward 1.4, approval of transportation expense plan, sales tax revenue estimate, regional transportation planning commission, funding targets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll uh, handle this item as well. Uh, before we can develop an expenditure plan, the first thing we need to figure out is how much money we anticipate to get if we impose a sales tax. The question in front of you is, what is that sales tax rate? Is it a quarter cent, half cent, for how l or, or a fraction or a different fraction? Uh, what is the duration we're going to uh, impose the tax rate uh, for assuming it, it's approved by the voters. As you recall, Measure X in 2016 was a half a percent uh, sales tax for 30 years. Uh, we presented in the staff report revenue estimates for different duration. These are all assuming half cent sales tax. If it's a quarter cents, it's basically half these amounts. They're all in constant $2018. It's roughly half a billion dollars for every five years. Uh, that's how much a new sales tax would generate. Uh, HDL companies, we have Susie from HDL helped us, Hi, Susie. helped us develop uh, these estimates based on the same assumptions that you approved uh, in December for the development of the uh, 2019 strategic plan, which uh, went all the way to 2034. As you recall, that projection assumed as no growth for the next three years in anticipation of a slowdown in the economy and then a transition period before going up to 4.5% growth rate per year. Uh, beyond 2034, uh, this, uh, this uh, projection assumes uh, a more conservative growth rate. Um, as population growth is likely to slow down uh, because we would probably have less land to develop. And also, when you go out 30, 40 years, um, it's prudent to be conservative, as we learned with Measure J and Measure C. Uh, more, you're more likely to have more recessionary periods, more uncertainties that you could impact your economy. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. A 30-year half-cent sales tax, just based on the table in front of you, would generate $3 billion, $3.06 billion. Um, and you saw from my last presentation, the funding needs to do that partial list uh, was over $3.1 billion. So uh, I'll, that, that's my presentation. All right. Comments, questions? Do we need to make this decision tonight? I'm hoping, thank you, Julie's shaking her head, because I think that's something we need to do as part of our outreach. Although I heard you say we can't develop what we're going to do unless we know how much money we're going to have. Um, maybe we ask staff to come back with what we could do based on the, the one you're mentioning in the staff report, but um, I know I'm always, you know, when we, back in 1988, you know, 2018 or whatever seemed like, you know, so far ahead. And then when we did J in 2035, you know, I'll be dead in 2060, 2055 probably, probably 2050. So there's a lot of people who we want to vote for this. And when they think about that, you know, good, you're all laughing because I think it's sort of true. Uh, Excuse me. I um, I just would like to hear what the public thinks we should do. But on that talk, and remember, optimism and pessimism. You'll be here. All right, Julie. 
Yeah, some of us will be 100 and need that senior uh, transportation for sure. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a decision that we can make as we go forward. But one of the things we need to kind of think about in parallel is how accurately can we project ahead when we're putting together a transportation expenditure plan and what we'll need to do what and how much can you list. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is maybe the potential to do 30 or maybe even 40 years, that's a long ways out, uh, to sell, but on the other hand, the problems never are going to go away. But maybe it gets couched so that every X number of years we update the expenditure plan. Because with technology and changing conditions and, I mean, everything from climate change to, to uh, new innovation, um, and maybe even getting jobs into Contra Costa County where we don't have to travel for half of our day, um, you know, we might have different solutions 10 years out or 20 years out. And so maybe there's a, just a food for thought, maybe sticking in some thought about do we update the expenditure plan every 10 years so that the public has a chance to weigh in every X amount of years to have their feedback into what works today versus what worked 10 years ago. Just a thought. This, this was an action. No decision needed on that. So this is an action item, correct? That's why I asked the question. Right. It's an action item, but. Isn't that just to accept the projections? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or is it to decide the no, period? Can we think about it for a week since we're meeting next week? So we want to delay this. We, want, we can take. So do we need to bring this back. You know, we're doing a projection at ABAG right, and MTC right now to do our, our every four-year plan. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a projection for 2050. And it is so far out. And that's what 30 years buys us, is 2050. Um, I'll be 100 years old that year. Yeah. Um, a lot of us probably be won't be here, meeting. but we're planning for our grandkids. And somehow, maybe our grandkids need to make the decision at that point. So, R Randy, you want to say something? God, I'd love to be here at 97. <laughs> here, cut, cut yours off, dude. Commissioners, uh, if, if you, I wasn't here in 2003, 2002 time frame. But I was here in 2016, and we started out at 25 years, and we put a strict uh, expenditure plan together. And based on everybody's input, what happened was there wasn't enough capacity to cover everything in that expenditure plan. So we went from 25 years to 30 to cover that extra, I can't remember how much, what, what, what it was, $400 million in that time. And that's how we came up with 30 years. And so if you look at some of the, what you're going to hear in the, in the next presentation, maybe some pushback on an expenditure plan that may need bolstering in certain areas, reducing in other areas, and then it will help you make a decision on do, I, do you need 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, or 40. So we have time to decide, but I think it's not a chicken and egg. The expenditure plan will drive the years of service if you want to put, do everything in, in that plan. I think that's the critical piece is take a look at what's in, in the draft expenditure plan so far and then try to figure out exactly how long you think that the voters would want to go out. Because you can go out 40 years. L.A. is out two pennies forever. Yep. So that generates um, $120 billion over the first 40 years. Now, I'm not saying we do it two, two pennies forever, but that would generate a lot of money for Contra Costa. So that's just an example. So with this item, I think we're going to, okay. No, I, I want to stress what he just said. We're, we are so quick to cut back to 25 or 20 or whatever because we get pushback from the press. The reality is L.A. passed two measures with no sunset, and that's our competition. you got to go for matching funds. That's where we're making these deals. And if we're not thinking ahead, I don't think we need to dismiss the 40-year quickly. All right. 
I move to continue this to our June uh, 12th meeting. I would second that, but maybe we make a recommendation of a minimum of 30 just to give staff a target. Sure, I have I no problem. Does, does that work? Yeah. That I'll leave it to started. staff. You know, you can give us two scenarios, um, you know, 30, 40, 50. I don't know. Seventy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Okay. I do have one thing that happens uh, if we um, say thirty is that along the way J ends, and, and so there's a reduction in the sales tax rate that people are actually paying, and that might be a point in time to look at or consider. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. We have a first and a second to extend this. Okay, we'll call for the Randy. Uh, Chair, Chair Taylor, I heard something a little bit different. I heard a motion to start out at 30 years so staff would have a target and then come back later. That, that's what I heard. I don't know if that's true or not. You know, it's a lot of work. I, I just, if we have to settle on a time frame and a dollar figure, Let's, can you do 30, 40, and 50? And if next week is too soon, we're meeting on the 19th. That's only two weeks away. Um, I'll leave it to staff. I just want to continue the item to a date appropriate when staff is ready to come back and give us the information that I think you understand we need within the time frame that you need an answer from. Okay. We can live with that for a week. That Okay, I'm not going to repeat that. I have a first and a second. And a second. We'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. All right. Okay. This moves up to number 1.5, proposed transportation. Transportation Expenditure Plan Structure and Strategies. And Tim Hale. Good evening, board. My name is Tim Hale, a Deputy Executive Director for Projects. And I'm going to try to make this item uh, somewhat brief because the next item is actually a little, little meaty in terms of actually getting into some of the more of the strategies and detailed discussions of how we're actually structuring the uh, Transportation Expenditure Plan. But what we wanted to discuss with this item is really seeking your input on what you think the structure and strategies would be to put into a transportation expenditure plan. And I think we've already been kind of discussing it, and I think it kind of t goes back to what is the problem? And so the problem is that people can't get around in Contra Costa and in the Bay Area. And I think, and there's a lot of reasons that's contributed to, but the system doesn't work anymore. And so to bring that system together and work together is, is kind of what we've been hearing in the focus groups and the polling and making sure that it's a complete integrated transportation system and it doesn't care who's operating it, whether it's BART or County Connection or CCTA or, or Uber or Lyft, or, it doesn't matter. They want one integrated system to be able to get around. And it's accessible, it's affordable, and so as we start getting into the next item, you know, we want to start, as much as we're using the 2016 TEP as the foundation um, in terms of developing the transportation expenditure plan, we're trying to take what we're hearing and incorporate it into more of a outcomes-based TEP, um, looking at some of the, making sure that we can walk away at some point in time in August with some quantitative benefits that the TEP will have. So people want to know, they don't want to know about the projects. They want to know that, you know, this is how much travel time it's going to get me in this corridor. They want to know that they're going to be able to spend more time with family. They know they're going to be able to get to that evening football game or basketball game. And so making sure that they can look at some sort of app or map and say, okay, I can rely on this commute. I, or, or when I get off the bus, when I get off BART, I know that that bus is going to be there. You know, and so that's what we need to focus on in this TEP to make sure we've got an integrated, reliable system. Mr. And Chair. so, yes. and I know Mr. Glover wants to speak too. I'm trying. I'm hoping that you would all agree. We all have ideas, mm -hmm. but you guys are the experts. This is not our first rodeo. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to see staff come back 
with some of those concepts based on the conversations we had two weeks ago, tonight, and different things. I'm not saying we shouldn't cut off the discussion. On the other hand, I have an idea, you have an idea, with the poll has an idea. We've all, we've been there, done that, and we've got people in the audience. So um, I just think that's more efficient use of all of our time, and then I we can the add on or take that. away. The Pardon next me? item, I think, has that. I'm sorry? That's what's in the next item. The next item. Well, then what's this item for? So I'm going to go over just real quick the structure. So what we're proposing is a five-section five structure TEP. One that's focused on a new transportation future for Contra Costa County. One that's going to be looking at what has the last three decades of improvements have done for Contra Costa County. D develop a roadmap for the future and then look at what these proposed trans transportation investments will actually do for the county. And so real briefly, um, we want to make sure people share in the vision and get and understand the vision and we want that right up in front in the document. And then give an overall summary of what the expenditures are going to be in the, in the overall TEP and then talk about the overall summary, what benefits or what outcomes will be coming in each subregion, and then also look at transportation investments at a glance by, say, transit and alternatives by alternative modes, freeways, and, and, um, and local improvements. And so, and also I have to summarize the benefits. So someone can actually read just the first section, first section, and they don't have to read the rest of it. The second section will get into who is CCTA, what do we do, and what, ha what the benefits they received out of Measure J, um, and why we should extend and augment the measure, and also reflect some of the things going on with SB1 and RM3. And then we would also talk about how the, a roadmap for the future, which is what will the TEP accomplish? You know, how is it created, outcomes-based, define the benefits, really wrap around the guiding principles that the authority approved in May, and then get into the proposed transportation investments. And so rather having, you know, very detailed descriptions of what each of these funding categories will do, we want, we want to focus on outcomes, funding requirements, and what the need is, and make and fund and structure the categories around those three components, and you'll see that in the actual next item. And then we'll also talk about policy statements. So I'm going to stop talking and get receive, receive input. I'm serious. I've looked at the, there's Um, so, well, I, I do have a couple of questions, Tim, so go ahead. I just have a question. You know, we talk about the benefit that's going to be uh, provided to the ride share folks and the transit folks. Are they participating in the process? Have we brought them in to participate in this process? Because they're certainly benefactors of whatever happens out there with our roads. You're talking about like Uber and Lyft, Uber, Lyft ride share? Yes. Um, well, we work, we work a lot with Uber and Lyft at Gomentum Station, and so, and I think we, there's also lots of research out there in terms of how rideshare is affecting transportation, and so um, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, we can definitely propose meeting with Uber and Lyft, but, but uh, we are certainly looking at resources to understand how rideshare would affect the TEP. Okay. I, I think it's important that, that these people that are big benefactors from using our roadways, that they also sit at a table where they can participate. Commissioner, commissioners, another way of approaching that, rather than to go directly with Uber and Lyft, is to provide incentives and let us control who, you, who gets those incentives to then utilize either Uber and or Lyft and or some other technology. So rather than to bind yourself directly with Uber and Lyft, you may want to think in another way of, of getting into the ride share market without getting into the ride share market because you never know how that's going to be perceived. So that, that, that's one of the things that we looked at is rather than deal directly, deal with it indirectly in the form of an incentive or reward. So, so that, you guys are very smart in the way that you think about things. I just know that, that I want to put that out there because I think there's an opportunity. Janet. So uh, Heather, I didn't, oh, I didn't even know I had it up. Um, um, on the other hand, you turned it off. I did turn it, okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Uber excludes people in wheelchairs from their system. So is that who you really want to prioritize? I want to have a discussion. Um, I've had a discussion. They do not prioritize. <laughs> okay, I um, so I, that's why I think what Randy's saying 
is a more open way of saying it. Well, and I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing uh -huh. with that. I'm just, I would put it out there. He just put it out there. All right. We got it. Okay. Now, Tim, <laughs> were you finished? Because you weren't, you are finished. Yeah, and I moved the item. And, you, yeah. and I'm not quite sure what item you moved. His item? 1.5. You moved 1.5. Yeah, the next item is 1.6. And right. I'll I invite a, I, Don to come up and we'll have, right, a, I have a much first, more robust, robust discussion about the TEP. I, I have a first on 1.5. I have a second on 1.5. Is there any more discussion? Oh, I second. Yeah, he no, seconded. No. All right, we're called for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passed unanimously. Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask Mr. Hale. I'm looking at the recommendation for 1.6. Staff seeks authority comments regarding the framework, funding categories, and policy statements. I'm not sure why we're going over this. I'd rather see what they are. We, we Funding categories we don't have yet. So yes, we do. I... Yes, we do. We're going over it in that item, actually. All right. Okay. We move on to 1.6, Discuss Initial Draft Transportation Expenditure Plan. And what I've done, would like to ask Don to facilitate the board discussion. Thank you. So I'm, uh, I'm your newest board. staff member. Nice to be here. And, um, Karen, I just want to say that I certainly hope you're around beyond 2052 because I'd like you to come to my 100th birthday celebration. I'll be happy to attend. Thank you, Don. So, thank you. Maybe we'll all be living at least to 100. They're getting to that point. All right. So um, let, so, I, so I have a vision. Well, hang on. I have a vision that I'm thinking about as, I, as we start this, which is imagine that we are at the March board authority meeting. The measure has been successful and we're beginning to think about how to use the measure to transform transportation in Contra Costa County. I think that to me that's sort of one of the mindsets we need to approach this with. That that we're being given or you know the, the voters will grant us control over a substantial amount of money whether it's a 30 year measure or a 40 year measure or a 50 year measure it's a lot of money over a long period of time. And we have an obligation to them to show how we can use that to their benefit. And in summary, I really like the outcomes that Tom mentioned earlier. We, for, the, for those of you who want to take transit, we're going to make it better so that more people will want to take transit. And for those who are going to stay on the roads, we're going to make those better because other people are going to be taking transit. Plus, we'll make some improvements to the roads. So, so that really has been the, the driving vision behind uh, what we're putting in front of you tonight, which is a first draft of funding categories and also first draft of policy statements. And I will say first, these are initial drafts. Any comment is appreciated. Um, this launches an effort of, of over the next two weeks getting more comments, refining these, and then hopefully we'll be in a position on the meeting on the 19th to release a draft tap for public review, we'll provide updates. That will, of course, change by the time we come up with a, a one that hopefully will start circulating to the cities in August. So, so what I've been asked to do is, and I, and I learned that when you're the new staff member, in a sense, they don't tell you that they get all the short presentations and the new staff member gets the long presentation. So <laughs> please please bear with me, and I've come up with a way to maybe make this go a little bit faster. I, I but, need some clarification. When you say you're a new staff member, and that's fine with me, but my last recollection is we put Don as the chair yeah. of the group. Has that concept I'm, I'm changed? I'm facilitating. You paid me 100 meeting. I, I, I understand it. Right. So you're, that's how it is. Thank yeah. you. I just yeah. need to... Right. So anyway, um, so so with that background, when I talk a little bit about how we got got here, so we built from what we created in 2016, which is not meant to say that we were wedded to that, but people around this table and other people put a lot of effort into putting that plan together. It failed, so we need to recognize that. It didn't fail by that much, and we also need to recognize that. But things have changed. The other thing we learned in the focus groups and from our own observations is that we need to make this measure more outcomes based as opposed to project or we're going to fund buses or things like that based. And do that in a way that's consistent with our guiding principles and benefits. 
we've already gathered a fair amount of regional stakeholder and public input. And as I was saying to a member of the audience tonight, I think we're maybe three quarters of our way through the first round of talking to stakeholders. And there'll be many more rounds to come. So we've learned a lot, but we've got a lot more to learn. We've, we have come up with some defined funding categories, descriptions, outcomes, and eligibility requirements that you're going to see in a minute. And we had policy statements in Measure X. We already believe that some of those policy statements should change, and we'll, what you have in front of you in the packet are the Measure X policy statements. We'll be talking about directions that we think some of those policy statements should go subject to your input to us. So, so that's where we're going. So let me go from there and say, first, how is this measure transformative? Well, if you take the money that's allocated in this measure that's allocated to transit and alternative modes of travel other than private vehicles, it equals half of the non-planning and administrative funds. We've never put a measure before our voters that's anywhere close. And this is pretty comparable to what other measures in other counties that have passed have had. So that, that's a big change. Local improvements remains at about 20, is about 26%, and freeways and interchanges is around 21%. So that is a directional change which would allow us to transform the nature of how we assist people getting around in this county. Now, I'm going to refer you to some of the documents that I hope you have in front of you. I hope that you were passed out a copy of the slides. And the other thing you should have received was this really large spreadsheet that, you know, back when I was doing this work, you had to tape together because we didn't have printers this big. Um, and I'm going to go back and forth between the two. Right. So if we look at the funding categories and amount, there are basically four big funding categories and those are shown in the blue lines on your big spreadsheet. So that's relieve traffic on highways and interchanges, which is um, make bus, ferry, and commuter rail and BART safer, cleaner, and more reliable um, in the other category. So that adds up to the $3 billion that um, Hisham talked about. We are assuming a 30-year measure for the purpose of tonight's discussion. What I would suggest you allow us to do with regards to next week is to talk conceptually about how this might change if it were a 40-year measure or if it were a measure in perpetuity. Not to come back with a specific expenditure plan, but um, to say in, in general what might we do. So, so now we've got four major categories. You've seen them on, on this sheet, and there are subcategories within that. And then the information on the white lines are example activities that could occur within those subcategories, and the subcategories are the yellow lines. Does anybody have, hopefully everyone can distinguish the colors. Okay. All right. So let's take the first one of these, which is the relief traffic on highways and interchanges. And you can see that that in turn, in this case, it's broken down to about, uh, what, seven different major categories. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so everybody's set? So if you look at your large sheet, you will see that the yellow lines are the same as the text here, like improved transit reliability along the I-80 and I-680 corridors, and $145 million, et cetera. The white lines on your big sheet show example things that we might do within that category. What we've also done is we prepare charts like this for each one of those major categories. It talks about what are the outcomes that people would receive if we pursued that element of the strategy. 
what are the needs it's fulfilling, and what funding requirements would we, would we propose to put in place so that a recipient could get those funds? So for example, return to source is one we're familiar with. They have to do a growth management compliance checklist, et cetera. So there are funding requirements for a series of these. So we have one of these charts for every line item. And one way to, to do the rest of my presentation is we could look at this, and then we could go through each one of those charts, which will take a while. Or you could look down this list and say, here are the categories I'd like to know more about in terms of example projects, outcomes, needs, and funding requirements. I, pr I propose the latter approach. <laughs> so given that, um, on this page, are there any of these categories you'd like to go into in more detail this evening? You can always send us comments later. I don't questions. want to comment, again, Don, but why, when you look at the numbers or estimates, the first thing that I drew to is the two that were 200,000, 200, 200 million. Yeah. Uh, any special notes or something we should know about or is it just that it kind of touches all the different areas? What was in mind when the two largest, or I guess you can go three if you want to, uh, but I, those two hit me right off the bat, the two, 200s. Right. Anything in particular? Tim, go ahead. So the improved traffic flow interchange along Highway 4, State Route 242, the projects within that category, potential projects that could be funded in that category, is actually shown in the white lines on the middle of your first page. Um, and this would be projects like um, improving operations and reliability of the Highway 4 between 242 and Bailey Road. Um, that's a, so basically at that whole 684 confluence um, in that, so the 684 interchange, the white, you know, potential widening or, or operational improvements, that whole bottleneck that is occurring right now, we're realizing congestion in the morning and afternoon peaks. So that dollar amount, it, and again, as in Hisham's presentation, doesn't necessarily capture all of the cost, but it at least provides us enough funding to match and leverage to fully fund th those projects in those categories. And then on, and then in, the relieve congestion, improve local access all Interstate 680 corridor. That's the Innovate 680 uh, projects, and so that's improving in uh, the in closing the gap in the HOV from uh, 24 to 242, and converting that to an ex extending the express lane from Red Gear all the way up Benicia Martinez Bridge. And then, if you can take the top two and combine them, that's essentially looking at the I-80 corridor. Um, there's a little bit of transit for 680 in the top corridor, but looking at both both those items in terms of this 80 corridor improving congestion and, and transit reliability in the in the 80 corridor yeah i would just said when i look at there they're the two biggest numbers if it ever got to people seeing this and i'm looking at the 200 million at the bottom saying this is what i've got to make or break selling this to my residents and if there's something else you add to that then i'll be listening okay are there any other categories anyone wants to go? Uh, well, Kevin I, and then I, Newell. I would just like to look at changing the, the almost the title of uh, the traffic on right uh, interchange along Highway Four and State Route Two Forty Two. So we we we're, we're including the Six Eighty interchange with that, right? So let's put Six Eighty in there because if you're only if you're only reading the highlights, you want to know specifically what it is. Highway Four goes from from Hercules. To Byron, we don't want them confusing Highway Four and 242 with coming over the hill and meeting okay. 242 there. We want to make sure that's understood for this particular segment of, of discussion. We're talking basically from Morello in Martinez to the 242, including the 680 interchange. And so I think we need to include that somewhere in that in that line, so it's so it's really clear what it is we're describing here and why it's so much. Great, thank you, Newell. Um, yeah, Don. Uh, first of all, thanks for all the work. I know you've been working. You're working full time. Yeah, hey, I'm getting so. paid now. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you work 40 hours to get to that one meeting for $100. I did that for per meeting. I think Thank it should you. be per hour. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm going to tick off a little bit on what Dave was saying. Um, when you look at this category, it, it sort of looks good. Which one? Um, where it has $200 million for congestion relief along uh, Interstate 680. Okay. But when you look at the detail, doesn't have anything really to do with the San Ramon Valley. So all the work that we put in, we learned a lesson. 
we found is where we put auxiliary lanes in, traffic moves really well. So therefore, if you know that the corridor well, where doesn't it work? It doesn't work between Walnut Creek and Diablo Valley Road. I mean, Dia uh, Diablo Road. And the reason is because there's no auxiliary lanes there. It's gridlocked there. So what we found was by doing the auxiliary lanes originally in San Ramon, it just moved it a little bit. Then we did in Danville and moved it. So somehow, and the bus on the shoulder, you know, just keeping track of the number of incidents per day, as much as we want to do that, and that would be a great target. If you look at the incident reports, the lanes are blocked during rush hours. The reason why is there's so many accidents, so many things that are happening there. Um, but we also have problems in San Ramon, for example, um, of getting people on and off the freeway. The capacity of the way those on and off ramps don't have enough stacking distance, they don't have enough width to be able to do things. None of those projects are listed. So it looks like, i got to be honest to the people in, in South County, this ain't going to help them if we don't think about transformative things that will move that. Because we spend all that money and it's kind of like a waste. Right? It's like the river, and we drop the big boulder right back down in the middle, and we can't get around the boulder through Alamo. And then we get to Bolt, where we have all of the, the great jobs, which is helping in San Ramon. On Bollinger, you've got a capacity, you've got a single lane trying to get people onto the freeway. And we know ramp metering will be coming with technology as time goes forward, but we don't have enough stacking distance. All it's going to do is dump it on our, our local streets. And then we've got gridlock, and you can't even get to the freeway. So um, in those categories, I think we need to be um, um, a little bit more robust of what we're going to do. Or we're going to end up right back where we were before. People are going to say, well, it's great you're spending $1.2 billion on these guys. We've got to do something, because that is now the major artery, right? We, got, we have two in our county. It's really Highway 4, and it's 680, 24. And 24, if you really think about it, you know, maybe it looks good fixing up the two tunnels. It ain't going to change the capacity. It's not going to no. do anything. But more so, think about had we not done that fourth bore, I mean, it's gridlock now. It doesn't function because of the volume of traffic. It's just simply traffic volumes. So we'd be really bad off. So what can we do there? There's a similar problem. And, you know, there are auxiliary lanes through a certain section that section works, and then it, and you can just look at it. Just if we got our um, uh, drones up and quit looking at computer models, you could actually see in real time what's happening and why it's happening, and focus on solving those problems where we're missing some auxiliary lanes. I think for sort of central and south, those have to somehow come in that we're really going to do that. And if we tell people we're doing bus on shoulder, well, it's, I, I want to do it someplace. But it's not going to get San Ramon Valley at all the vote for it, at all. It ain't going to happen. It just it, it won't do anything. It, and there's, because the busters are going to be back onto the regular lanes because the shoulders are going to have accidents on there. So, okay. Good anyway. feedback. Um, to follow up, I agree with Noel's points, but if you look, that is in there. Uh, maybe we just need to again, make the headline a little sexier. I'm trying to figure out why you put it in this order. Let's put the, my thought is put the expensive things on top because those are the ones that are going to get the biggest bang for the buck. But the I-680 corridor is exactly what Newell's talking about. Um, Highway 4 and State Route 242, that's its own category. If you look, I mean, it's all the things you're talking about, transit connection, uh, transit improvements and shared mobility, transit lane. It's all on I-680. So maybe it's just how we word it. I think okay. what everybody is talking about is already here. Um, and again, I really hope we don't get into a wordsmithing thing here. Uh, the concept is there. I, at least I see that the well, concept is there. Not on 680. 680 yeah, is about look, North Pound Express. Advanced Technologies has nothing to do with what I was talking about. Not, Concord Avenue, 680. No, well, look under improved transit reliability along I-80 and I-680 corridors. The first one. I-680, or move them up. I have no problem with that. Move them up so people see it. But you've got your transit improvements and shared mobility, and you've got your part-time transit lanes. Yeah. 
Actually, those are the things that I was talking about that are going to cause the problem that people aren't going to vote. So for. you those want to add auxiliary people. lanes? I, I think we've got to come up with something that's very literal um, because well, by again, the, then, so, then so then part-time transit take that. lane is bus on shoulder. Um, transit improvement, sh shared mobility hubs, that's not that's well, not yeah, improving okay. Those. We need to use words that people understand. Right. But those are different ideas, is what I'm pointing out. I was just trying to say those are totally right. different ideas. So, so, so not that they're bad. Commiss right. Commissioners, we have yeah. worked on the language of this at least 13 or 14 iterations and trying to get it the right mix. And so this, these, this is great. Operational this improvements great. along 680, they know, people know what auxiliary lanes do. So maybe we need to focus right. in more on auxiliary this, lanes, less on advanced technology. This, but this the point is that. we have a multifaceted yeah. approach to dealing with the congestion on 680 because it is one arterial that is very clogged. And we want to make sure that freeway gets opened up a little bit. So this and, is this is great comment. And we've been through the wording 10 times, and we're going to go through it another 10 Please. times, and every time it's going to get better, so thank well, you. Well, and as I recall, <laughs> then there's further discussion or description of what each of these things are once we get to the TEP. So right, you'll see that. And so this is good information for that. Right. And one of the things that we're in general doing is writing the TEP this time so that is indicative of what we might do, but not totally prescriptive. Which gives which gives the authority more flexibility, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, just just a comment I would make in the ad hoc committee. You sent some of us back to kind of preview some of this information, and to work with staff on it. And we actually debated whether to put the white lined projects in this or not. And and I I think um, Tim was sort of in favor of the blue lines and the yellow lines and leaving the white lines blank for this meeting. And I argued to give an example. Yeah. So they're examples. They are not definitive. We're not done yet. So, but, but to get down to, you know, super specific, we're not quite there yet. So what they're asking for are we, if I understand correctly, is do we have the, kind of the right categories? Are we are we starting in the right direction? I mean, we're only focused on the first, you know, two thirds of the first page, and we've got another page and a half right. behind that. So, I, you know, I think we've got an idea. These are project projects, but we've also got programs we right. got to talk about, right. and right. those are really important. And I thought our direction also was to, have to, to, to jump off of what we did in Measure X. I'm not unless I'm really. Okay. Put your speaker on. I did, but it won't, now it comes on. Um, I'm not seeing a whole bunch of difference. And, and so I just, to me, I, I, I thought the direction was build on what we did last time. So these look pretty much the same. We've all already agreed to a lot of this stuff, in my opinion. Commissioner Haskell. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I, I, it's off topic. I will grant you this is off topic, but I am sitting here and as we're going through this list and I hear Newell talking and I hear everybody kind of saying, well, we've got to put our arms around the people. I'm voting on this and I'm thinking as a just person voting that I expect this all to happen really quickly. I have no concept of the timeline that this is, this is going to happen. And I don't want to... I don't want to oversell. I really, really want to give some kind of indication somewhere in your topic to get people's expectations to reality. I, I think we can use what we did with, with Measure J as a, as a way of explaining how, how in the world of how quickly we can get things done in the world of transportation. <laughs> Nothing happens quickly. But what we did with Measure J and the projects and programs that we completed under Measure J, in the amount of time that we did it, I think is is, 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 is was really fast. And you're right; everybody wants it tomorrow. We all know it's not going to happen that way. But if but if in our introduction we can, I, I think you went over this in that first paragraph. We, we we talk about the accomplishments of Measure J. How much how much you know, we have a 30 year program and we finished all the projects in in 10 in, uh, or whatever it was or something like 10. Or even less than that, close to ten. So, we, so, we, so, we, so, we, so we crow about what we've done in the past and saying this is what, this is what our expectations are for this new measure we're talking about. Also, Commissioner Abelson. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh wait. I, oh, I. While I've got Newell here, I want to 
because I want to stay on this subject. I have that same, not intrepid, whatever the word is, but that that we're missing something. I, I was, and it, it's this is more specific than what you have here. I think it's in the wording that you have, but it isn't something I could take to somebody that doesn't know what we do and explain it. In the meeting before, I was pulling out this package, and we have something that people can relate to, and they think there's value. It'll never get done, but they think there's value. Before it was BART down 680, Walnut Creek to Dublin, and that resonated with people. It isn't going to happen. Now we have the autonomous transit between Walnut Creek and the Dublin BART station. And I'm wondering when we get down to really selling this, is this something that's going to be in there or is that just going to be masked under incentive? This is the uh, outcome requirements and needs page for that 680 category. Um, and I think we're all talking about the same thing in terms of what we want to achieve. When we give examples of what may be included, I think we're getting good feedback as to other things to, to mention to include. Okay. Can I get you in a minute? I'll, I'll get you in a minute. Jan? Okay. Yeah, I I'm looking at this and I'm I look at the first two yellow categories and what's under them, and I can't even quite figure it out because the I I eighty um, stuff is in both categories, and I think about whether or not some of it's been done, and it still hasn't uh, from, from the current measure. And um, it's in with 680 stuff, and I can't figure out, I can barely figure out a connection. Um, but so it's really confusing to me, and I, I'm thinking if I were, um, a generic voter in my area, and they would see the, some I-80 transit-looking stuff in the first yellow, and the bottom yellow has some more, but I can't figure out what anything is doing except that it's combined with another area, and unless we're going to change our whole structure of our subregional No, I, groups, I see what I, you're saying, Janet. I if I'm a voter, put all the I-80 stuff in one category. Yeah. Put all the I-680 stuff in one category. Right. Put all the, there's a 580. I, I, I know it's a different way of doing it, but you've got a valid point. I'm not saying that we um, need to change it, but I get what you're saying. Right. So it would make me, um, it would discourage, because I don't know what, if I'm the generic voter in, the I-80 area, I'm not going to know what, six, I'm hardly going to know what 680 is, perhaps. And vice versa is true also. So I think it's important to sort of connect the things together that keep, people can associate um, with themselves. All right. All right. I, I just yeah. wanted to kind of provide provide some feedback on, on that comment that we originally actually had it set up that way. We had it all broken up by corridor. And what we kind of found is that, you know, based on what we've heard, is that people are looking for better transit. And so what happened was the transit was just buried in with the capital projects. And so what we tried to do is within the congestion relief category, we tried to bring the transit out of all those other categories and actually focus a category on just transit capital and then Later down in the expenditure plan, you'll actually see programs for transportation, for transit operations, and for other transit projects as well. But, but this is intended to focus on transit that can relieve congested corridors, so like 680 and 80. So that's, that's, that was the thought process. We're happy to put it back the way it was, but that was the thought process. What, what, what may be critical going, going back there is making sure when we list something as transit that everyone knows what we're talking about. I mean, we, everybody here knows what we're talking about, but if we take it to a man on the street and we say, we're going to improve transit in your area, are they going to understand what that transit means? Um, is there a better way of, of, of describing what our intent is here? Um, so that we could categorize everything under transit, uh, planes, trains, automobiles, or whatever we want to call it in there. Um, as far as describing 
what type of transit improvements we have in there. I think the intent was, and it's probably not described well here, um, was to kind of illustrate that there are capital projects that are transit projects. It's not all rolling stock. No, I understand. It's you got to have a physical improvement to make transit work. And so we're trying to separate out, and we thought it might be a good idea, to show we're spending a lot of permanent money on capital projects to enable transit to be effective. But I don't think that the generic voter cares about... Well, I think if we describe it differently, they might. I mean, because in, in many places, including the I-80 corridor, unless you have a dedicated lane for buses, going on a bus in the I-80 corridor isn't going to get you there any faster than, than the guy in the single occupant vehicle because he doesn't have a lane that is dedicated to do that. And in many places, you're going to have to create a physical structure to be able to allow people to take transit and make it faster. And let me suggest that, that transit, well, but there, if I may, let me suggest that yeah. we could add one more category and talk about an I-80 transit investment category and, and then have a I-680 investment category. You've added one more category. You could lump the two I-80 things together. You could lump the two 680 things together and we've broken it out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, any more comments on that first category of relieving traffic on highways and interchanges? Before... All right, so this is the broad categories for bus, ferry, commuter rail, BART. Um, so we, um, these are categories that are similar to what we had in Measure X. So there was a separate bus service and reliability in West Contra Costa category that to make it clear that that wouldn't fund modes other than buses. Um, and that was a direction from WICTAC last time. We received no change. Um, and then we've consolidated the transit services other than BART in central, east, and southwest counties, just as we had in Measure X. There's an east county transit extension to Brentwood, and then connectivity with that to transit rail and parking. Um, and now I'm looking in, in your big sheet at the bottom of the first page, the second blue category. Um, there's about $80 million in there for ferry service and commuter rail. Which, and then um, BART, we've had a couple of meetings. Well, we've, had, we've had a meeting with BART and had some interaction with them. I think the interest we got from the focus groups and the research was doing things that facilitate cleaner and safer BART and making our contributions effective in Contra Costa County with an understanding we'll have to work out language so that those improvements don't occur just in Contra Costa County. And we've had, you know, and then BART and we are ready to, to meet and talk about that. Then the other thing we wanted to do was to fund some additional cars for eBART or additional train sets and provide parking and access improvements to BART around the county, recognizing that in many cases those will not be on BART property except when they're actually at the station. So while we're allocating funding, the funding doesn't necessarily need to go through BART. You know, same, same with an intermodal facility in Brentwood. If we extend eBART to Brentwood, then obviously BART needs a station there, but BART doesn't necessarily need to own the parking and the access routes. So would anyone like to look at any of these in more detail? OK. Hey, John, did you just want to uh, highlight on the, the new um, policy for transit? Uh, we'll come to that later. Okay. We've got some slides right, later. I'll do enough. the policies later. Um, what's my next big page? No, still. 23 Okay. So we've had safe transportation for students and youth. There is a, this is a fairly significant increase. And let me explain how we, we got there. We had a 
If you look at Measure BB from Alameda County, they had a program to provide subsidized transit for students and youth. And when we talked to some of the stakeholders in Alameda County who worked with low-income student and youth groups, they basically said, we had not been interested in transportation until this showed up. And suddenly we became interested and we mobilized our groups and we became big supporters. And I've heard that from others. That in fact, they really did become big supporters. It wasn't just this person telling me that. And it makes sense. It, um, you know, I've, you know, there, we've got that kind of facility. We've got those kind of services in the yellow school buses in SWAT. And I know Richmond does some support for school bus transportation. Antioch does some support for school bus transportation, as I recall from what Monica said. So the thought here is to make this a bigger program and put, I'm not sure this is the right amount of money to put into it, but it's a, it's a big jump from where we had in Measure X, which was about $64 million. Go ahead, Neil. Are you pausing? Yeah. So, so uh, just to, again, big broad category. So in SWAT, uh, one of the most successful programs is the congestion relief school bus right. program, right. Um, which we run as a private entity and we contract it out. Both La Romenda has theirs, San Ramon Valley. San Ramon Valley, I know the statistics, that's 1.1 million car trips a year it eliminates. It's probably the best thing that we've done. So specifically, what are you saying? This is such a broad category. Are we talking about giving away, buying down bus passes on our existing bus routes that aren't working? Or it may be that you know, we, we've, we've got bus routes that work during school trip periods in many parts of the county. Those tend to be the, the most crowded buses of the day. But is that the best? I, I just don't want to, again, this is talking about policy change Let me just that we could do targeted. What we found, and it's like the Sacramento model, we happen to have done it earlier here years, creating a customized system of routing using smaller vehicles and things like that, more cost-efficient vehicles. Right. And by the way, it's all organized labor. Um, and getting um, waiting lists. Right. We have so, waiting lists so, for people. So, so my point is, is if, if I don't want anybody to be misled on that because this is something that the voters are going to look at. Right. If it just says we're going to support our existing bus transit systems that in many cases don't work other than the long haul routes, Wait, let me just... <laughs> that if this comes back and says, hey, you know, we're going to come out with a customized system that will create routes at our schools to help relieve congestions off our arterials and things like that, right. then this is something you can start to say, you can understand why people would support it. But bus ridership for local routes, AC transit, are all dropping. It's the long haul routes that work. <coughs> okay. so, so are we just leaving this sort of loose and goosey? And well, I, I, this is where we're going to have to write some policies. Okay. And, and maybe one of the policies is to take a area by area approach. Because, for example, in La Marinda, because I'm familiar with our bus system, we couldn't have used the county connection routes because there's only one. Um, and it wouldn't have been able to serve all of our schools. So we needed to go to an alternative policy. In West County, in parts of Richmond, you may get very good service from AC Transit. Right. So, so this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. That's exactly what I want to make sure of, so right. we don't fall trapped into feeding the systems that don't work. Right. That we, that we really could use this area as something that's exciting because we can cite the ones that work well and how do we expand those? Because I could see a vision if there was more money available, we could create more customized routes that serve the specific areas to solve a specific problem that would be high impact, both for greenhouse gases and both getting people sitting in their butts on seats and filling them up. Right. So the, the other thing to note is that in the Alameda County example, one of the reasons some of the what I'll call social equity groups were particularly interested in this program was that it, in, it reduced one of the barriers of students going to school. And if students go to school, they're more likely to graduate. And if they're more likely to graduate, they're more likely to do well later on in life. That's all good. Um, so you know, so in, in your area, in my area, when we started these programs, it was congestion relief because we didn't have much of an issue of kids not going to school. 
But in other parts of the county, that may be different. So that's one of the reasons we need a locally customized approach. So, Amy. Thank you. And then Thank you, Julie. Mr. Chair. You know, I, I think it's important to understand that in all of our transit agencies, we have what we call school tripper routes. And what they do is that they leverage the public investment in an existing transit system and provide direct services for school children. So using, you know, County Connection, we've got a whole list of routes serving, you know, the, the, the school districts. And I, I think that that is the model that we would be looking at. The, the, the challenge with other kinds of c customized programs like the La Mirinda School Bus Program and, and Traffics is that they require a very high parent subsidy to operate. And what, what, what's that? Yeah. Oh God. I thought it was a helicopter landing. Right. Um, so I think that the the idea is that this you'd work with the individual you know transit agencies to identify where those those students could be could be served. And currently, in our county, absent the examples that Don cited, we really don't have a way to subsidize the the school youth uh, transit on our existing transit services. So if you were to compare the you look at the the studies we've done with County Connection that show student ridership on our systems, and, it, and, it's, and it's very impressive. And we have the capacity there, so I think this would be an excellent plan that would would utilize existing you know resources in a way that would make it affordable for the families that would would want to use that. So, um, and we can provide that information. I think all of our transit agencies, um, you know, I know certainly at County Connection, we've got some very good ridership data that shows where the people live, where the schools are, and how those routes um, serve. So. Yeah, I, and I agree with both of you, but I also think that, that we're, we're treating another social problem. It's not just affordability, it's accessibility. And, you know, while we do have some bus routes that do really, really well serving students, they're kind of along the main drags. And when you, when you get deeper into some neighborhoods, those parents are all driving those kids. And I will tell you, at least in my community, um, I, I got a text this morning from a mutual friend of all of ours who used to be the political reporter for the uh, Contra Costa Times back in the day who borrowed a piece of my driveway to go to the graduation for her grandson today from fifth grade. And she said, how do you manage to live in a neighborhood this close to a school? This is a zoo. I said, well, there are five times a day we don't come and go for half an hour at a time because it's a zoo and you can't get out of your own driveway. Um, right. Yep, right. and and it's it's like that. And But those parents, when you ask them, Will they carpool? Will they do something else? Um, you know, they're helicopter parents, and little Johnny has to be safe, and the only way Johnny is safe is if I take him to school and drop him off and see him across that gate. Now, would they put him on a specific school bus? I can tell you they won't put him on a city bus. They will not put him on a county connection bus to go to school because there might be some bad guy there. I mean, the paranoia level is that high. And so it's a social engineering issue to get people to go back to using school buses versus private cars. And that might be the first step, is to get smaller shuttles that can collect through neighborhoods and drop them off. And I'll bet you a lot of the moms would be real happy to have, go to their coffee clutch instead. And frankly, we wouldn't have the accidents of kids getting hit on their way to school that way either we we had one of those just a couple uh, a month or so ago and you know it's it's dangerous so I think we need to look at everything I think we need to be open to the options and maybe this isn't the only money out there I think there's money in RM3 that we could access for this too and there's probably other money mm -hmm. from other sources that we could access to build it into a more robust program but part of it's going to be convincing the public Right. That Johnny is safe on a school. Well, and I think if you look you... at if you look at the uh, SWAT examples, we've got two programs that combine carry about twenty five hundred students per day. Well, and and that's why you let. Let's go to the concept. I'll call it a grant or a block. You know, here's the money. 
community, tell us how you want it, and if you meet criteria. I mean, I think that's way down the road. I agree with what you're saying, but I don't think we have to worry about that right. at this point. All right, Janet. Okay. Well, I've been listening to what everyone has said, and I think you're talking about the Central County program. You're not talking about the West County program. It's not a, it's not the Richmond program. It's the whole, it's all of West County. And I was around and involved in setting it up initially, even before Major, definitely before Major J. Um, and um, w the problem we were working with was quite different. The problem we were working with was principals at schools saying, hey, we need help. Kids don't come to school at the end of the month because they can't, their parents can't afford it. And that's the problem that we were working with. And that's why we have a different program than you're describing. Our program in West County, um, in, in the West County School District, which is practically all of West County, um, calls for there to be an association. There's an association between the free and reduced lunch program eligibility and eligibility for riding transit. And we have lots of kids and lots of people in our area that ride the bus. And I can guarantee you that they still ride the bus because I'm one of them. And I'm out there on the main line where there isn't enough, there is not enough seating on the buses. There aren't enough buses. There isn't enough service. So we're not having a problem of no service whatsoever. And I think what that really speaks to is one size does not fit all. And um, I, I don't, I like the program in Central County for what I think it's really good at, and that's congestion relief. My understanding is it's uh, a very big positive component of congestion relief because most of the congestion is, is around the schools, as you described. That's what I started out saying, is that in West County, we need a more on social equity than congestion. We need, so we're, so I'm just yeah. bringing it back home and I just want to clarify that in West County, um, it's, it's a, it is a very different issue and that's why I think so, we've so always by region, been. By region, uh, okay. what we did in the last measure yeah. was did a set aside for especially that. for that. Exactly. And so, you, you know, I don't think that, mm -hmm. that that's been missed. Okay, well, I wanted to restate it because it was, until I said it today, I didn't really hear it. And I think it's okay both ways. I don't, you know, there's nothing wrong with it being that way. But I think that's why we have to uh, make a measure that appeals to people who are different. And right. anyway, I'll, I'll stop. Kevin. Right, you know, the, the concept, we, we, we make it a grant program and have school districts or, or, or communities come to us with plans so that so the, so that we're not stuck up here trying to dictate to every community what they need to do. You bring us a plan, we'll provide you some of the funding, all the funding, or, or whatever okay. is needed to get it to work. Okay, can I, I mean, can I just suggest, since Mr. Cha Cha Chair, since there's a lot of discussion, that's one I hear. There's a lot of interest in this in this program, but I, I think we should bring the transit operators it together with with our staff right now to talk about how each of the transit operators throughout our region would envision um, creating a you know either enhancing an existing program or creating a program and I think that would be helpful to us as we envision how this this might might play out because those are the resources that we're going to be affording to use I'm trying to get his so all right <laughs> Monica. Monica. Thank you. Thank you. So yesterday, myself, Don, and uh, the transit operators met, and this was something that bubbled up, and we did understand that each region, uh, when it comes to youth, had different kind of um, looks at it, but this was something that def definitely bubbled up with the transit operators, and it's definitely a popular program. Referring back to um, something Don had said about something what Antioch did, Antioch just bought, the city bought down the price of the bus passes during the summer for our youth, and it, it was very popular, and now our city is looking at, looking at possibly um, extending that program throughout the year. That, I just wanted to clarify on that. It wasn't, we were funding the school bus system that we just bought down bus passes, but um, 
yes, the bus operators are, are meeting. In fact, I think we're meeting again next week or in two weeks. But we are meeting to talk about specifically um, what is important uh, for, the, for these operators. We're happy. We're very happy that there's more funding coming to transit um, um, to be able to get people throughout the county of all ages. I wish Ms. Toth was still here. Uh, we even talked about seniors as well. So that conversation is happening. So where are we at? No. Well, I think you've given us good feedback, and it, it, you'll see this come back in the paragraph description of this item in the transit, transportation expenditure plan. I just, I just wanted to add one clarification, and, and I appreciate all of the work. My real point was, I, I was just bringing out an example of a program, that while we're, we have existing transit agencies, and, and Kevin said it, this is an opportunity of a funding category to be very clear, to be very clear that it may not be money going to our existing transit um, providers. Mm -hmm. We have the ability, based on some success, of showing how to target in each city, each region, how to create programs that work. And it may be in partnership. It may be a new entity. But I want to make sure that, that it's clear that that's the thought. It's not just going to be business as usual. So if a transit agency says, hey, I can solve this. Here's how I can do that. We'll look at it great. But just like some of us have come up with our own solutions, we may come up with another one, and it may be outside of that. So I want to make sure that that, that has that kind of flexibility, because I think that's what will change things in the future for the better. Okay, and experience of time, where are we at? Yeah. Say so the next category is something that was very similar to Measure X. We increased the funding from um, $115 million to $150 million. And this will be going out to the RTPCs, and they can all put right, in their all, stuff. Right. So I think we can move on on this. Right. So let's go on to the next one, which is local improvements to make your community better and protect the environment. So let me talk about the big one in this case. Well, that was what I was saying, Don. I mean, yeah, the, well, at least the, let me summarize it to see if we get any feedback. So um, in Measure J, return to source is 18%. In Measure X, it was proposed to be 23%. 20, well, it was originally, it came out to be 23. The proposal here is that we augment the 18% people get from Measure J by another, by two thirds, so another 12% through the life of Measure J. And then we increase it to 18%. So while it drops off, it drops off, it, it remains at what they would have gotten through Measure J. So the average of that is about, is the 15.2% you see on your big sheet. Um, but it's less than the 23% that was proposed in Measure X. Do that because we want to put a lot of money into the transit services and the buses. Well, I'm, I'm just trying and to make it clear. Yeah. Your, um, your pie charts at the very beginning right. showed that. Right. However, however, <laughs> um, <laughs> however, there's, if we, we got to also think, keep in mind how to get this thing passed. Right. So what that doesn't account for if you look at all the arterial roads, which is going to have buses, our trucks, all the things, those are the most expensive things in every city because you can't do um, little maintenance. You can't do slurry coats. It doesn't help them. Those are overlays. So, for example, I, I'll use Danville, and I'll pick another city in a second. Um, to do one arterial road would take five years, if we did it in, in five years, of 100% of funding from every category that's available to any city, just to do one. The reason cities are behind is they can't afford to do their, their arterial roads. So if we're going to reduce this, and we want those 19 cities, because, Don, you already know the answer to this, they don't support this. So in order to do that, you'd have to create a category which is done proportionately for arterial roads. And I don't mean I see a list of things. I mean that each city can has the right to do it, to put money towards our arterial road. That's not done on a percentage basis. There's, a, there's an amount of money in there. If we don't, we're fooling ourselves to think that we can add more capacity on these roads because of the fact they're going to deteriorate so bad. If you took San Ramon, for example, they have one arterial road that's probably $35 million, and they're barely spending $3 million with S being every fund they can get. They can't do it which is the reason why we have $1.1 billion. So if we think our trans this is a transportation improvement, that if we're going to reduce that, and that's really what it is, 
that you have to then categorize a designated fund, and it means it's going to come out with something else, to get it so that cities and the county, on a proportional basis, get money to do arterial roads. Those are like building freeways. And, and I'm suggesting that. It's important that we can sell and get all the cities and everybody on board because so without the, it. Quite the direction I would ask from the authority, if you want to go in that direction, is tell us what other categories to take it out of. That's uh, just a second. Now, if we're going to do that, then I'm going to give you a list. That's not, no, a, that's fair, that's not a fair way to approach that. I'm just suggesting, because you're doing the negotiation, you put this together, we didn't. So what you're saying is you've already made a deal no. with these things. No. Just to say, well, it's implied. Just, just listen to me. It's implied because here it is, right? So if you just asked a question, but I'm suggesting to change something, and you're saying, now what do you want to take it out of? You've got the knowledge of the things of where you have because we haven't been in intimately involved, so I think in all fairness, that maybe you could take that as a suggestion and come back with an alternative to that. Okay. I didn't interpret it that. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm going to take a slightly different um, perspective from that. I, I think SB1 gave us additional funds. RM3 gives us additional funds. Um, you know, we, as, as a city manager told me during the last go round, there will never be enough money for local streets and roads. I get that. But frankly, people don't really care as long as you keep the potholes somewhat filled how much you spend on local streets and roads. They want to be able to get where they're going, they want to get out of congestion. And They'll put up with a lot. Yeah, they would like a perfect road, um, but they want to be able to get through traffic. And, and that makes a difference. And so I really think we ought to give this a shot. I think it's up to all of us to try to sell it at home because, and I know there are a few city managers who are hanging their hat on this one, but I, I think we got to think about the bigger picture. Um, and it is. I mean, nobody wants potholes, but we're making progress on that. SB1 is finally free. RM3 is going to be free very soon, and that's going to give us another pot of money that we don't have right now. Um, you know, it's there will never be enough for local jurisdictions to keep up. We just have to do the best we can, and I would beg to differ, I think, continuous seal coating and doing it right with the right products and the newer products that last longer. We have technology folks here who can tell us about all of that. But, And maybe one of the things we look at, um, and I've suggested this a couple times before, and, and it hasn't been taken up yet, but maybe we'll look at a countywide program for doing our local streets and roads where we put a lot of those projects together and we get really big contracts that can drop the per square foot stuff down a lot and we get really good contractors doing it. I mean, yeah, there are only so many contractors, but you could have five or six working around the county on a bulk price that maybe we'd actually get better service for a whole lot less. I don't know, just a thought. So Don, where are we? So, so I know there are people who want to talk. Well, I guess what I would say, you know, we, we've got this in there for tonight. One of the things we can, if you look at the next category, it's improving traffic flow on local streets, and there are a bunch of examples. They're spread around the county. They're indicative. That's $290 million That also goes back to local agencies. So the total, if you go back to the original pie chart, was about 26% goes to local agencies. Um, we could show you, um, if you wish, uh, take, let's say, an additional 11 percent out of return, for, you know, add it to an arterial equivalent, return to source equivalent to get it to 23, and show you where we would take that money out of, and the authority can give direction. Okay, because I don't think we're ready to give you direction tonight. Right. <laughs> no, I understand. You got that. I think you're, uh, Hudson, your light's on. Yeah, I, this is, uh, this has been a long day discussing this, because right. I thought I was pro- no, let's do it. 114 uh, percent uh, return to source. Um, 
But the reality, just in the last few hours, I've flopped on it. And I think if we don't go down to what you're proposing right now, we jeopardize a very good expenditure plan early on. And I mean, I'll check in with the other people in my city, and I'm usually not on the same page with them. But I, I think I think the reality here is we're getting more than what we're going to get if it doesn't pass. We still need that thing to pass to get something. Uh, and there are little projects in there that I really uh, don't want to just give up on because of not getting more return to source. I, maybe at the end of the 2034, there's an adjustment. Uh, maybe there is, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, Julie suggested. But I think at this point, we have to take a real realistic look that at this 15 point whatever Don's come up with, if this is the answer, are we willing to go forward from this point? My answer is yes. Karen. Thank you. I want to thank Don and staff. You did a fabulous job. My confusion is back to the motion I made on the other issue. This is just, a, 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 I guess, our Christmas uh, list of what we could do and what those things would be to that caught how much they'd cost and yet your staff is going to come back and say if we did a 30-year plan here's how much money and some of this stuff would get trimmed off or raised up, or raised up. Yeah, just, all, all of this fits within a 30-year plan yeah. this is okay so that okay that's what I that's why I was confused on the other all right great so again I, I do want to thank you because uh, this is tremendous work and we did hear about the transit and I know that we've we've got to make sure we can get it passed. But, you know, if somebody's going to vote no on it because one thing isn't in there because that's what they want, they're going to vote no on it. Uh, you know, we all learned a long time ago um, we want to get to yes. What is it that people will vote for, not what are they going to vote against? And so if there's enough in there that people will vote for, I see my bus in there. I see first and last mile. I see my pothole getting, you know, if that's what they're looking for and that's what's going to get them to vote, then they're going to vote. So I'm not going to be as concerned about what's not in there, uh, although we need to be very cognizant of the areas that didn't vote and what makes it uh, in there to get them to vote. So what I'm, what I'm asking, Don, are we going to, we're not going to table this this time. Are we going to make action on this? Uh, we're going to take your input, and you'll Got see it. it come back in the next round. Okay, that's good. And then the only other one I wanted to bring your attention to is the seamless connected transportation options and reduce emissions. The equivalent category in Measure X had about $65 million. I think the technology has come a long way since then. And so this now talks about, you know, uh, charging station network, on-demand you know, on and guaranteed transit service, smart ride share, car share, and bike share services, or at least, you know, um, participating with those or at least providing an infrastructure for them, not choosing winners and losers per se. Right. Um, but that that's a big increase. Okay, we're good for that. Okay. Okay. Are you now, done? Well, I'm, what I would suggest now is you take public comment on the no. expenditure plan, uh, and I'd like a few minutes to talk about policies, if that's okay. Okay, because I do have a... a right. So, I, so if you, I, I do have I a speaker. A question. Do we need to have a policy discussion tonight? Can it wait till next week? It could. I'd like about five minutes. Five. That's good. You're good at five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a speaker card. This is uh, for Claudette, Claudette Burgess, AC Transit. We give, we've give. we been chatting about you, haven't we? Yes. Can I borrow this? Oh, certainly. Thank you. I'll try to make this brief um, since it's very late in the evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioners Claudia Burgos, uh, once again, Director of Legislative Affairs and Community Relations with AC Transit. Um, we are pleased uh, to be here and, and to be listening to this discussion uh, that you're having this evening and to see that this is, this is moving forward. Um, as stated earlier by Mayor Butt, um, I just wanted to just highlight the, bring us back to the, what the polling results showed, which is what you, what you were just discuss, discussing that voters really see a strong and clear connection between faster, safer, cleaner, more reliable, frequent transit and easy access um, to, with making transit a real alternative to driving and reducing overall congestion in the county. 
uh, transit improvements uh, registered as one of the top priorities um, within all of the regions polled, consistently polling at over 80%. Uh, we've been working with, uh, through WICTAC and WICTAC staff to put together a proposal that we've put forward um, to really look at ways to provide alternatives to the gridlock that exists today on the on I-80 corridor. Um, our initial review of the pro initial TEP sh showed that um, we were seeing only 15.5 percent in transit bus transit enhance, enhancements in West County. But after the discussion tonight and the clarification of how that funding is sort of mixed in in the different rows, um, we'll take a, another look at that and continue discussions with staff here and at WICTAC uh, just to make sure that funding for transit, for bus transit specifically in West County is is at um, levels that, that we would would want to see. Um, as has been mentioned earlier, benefits from funding transit not only benefit those that are on the bus, but they benefit everybody on the road. So thank you again for your work on this, and we look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you, and thank you for your patience. Uh, it, I have no other speaker cards on these topics. Now we're good. Let me talk about policies, and I'll try and do it in under five minutes. I'm not going to – the last section of slides, I'll deal with this, but if you look at this slide, I think it's – I can summarize the issues. In the 2016 version, we had several policy categories. Let me talk about what, discuss, what topics we might want to discuss. In the growth management program, urban limit line compliance, we might want to talk about the 30-acre exemption again. There were a variety of, of alternatives to what we had last time that have come up. You don't have to support them or not support them, but it's, you know, it's a topic. Uh, complete streets policy, there are minor amendments. Advanced mitigation policy was, took us a long time to develop last time. It's now sort of become part of the fabric of what we do. Um, so I think that should be fairly simple. Taxpayer safeguards and accountability, that will be similar. We've got groups of contractors and laborers working together to figure out some amendments to the policy and so we're going to let them do their work and then obviously it comes back to us. We're, we would like to the authority to consider three new policy categories. One is a transit policy um, which would sort of work really focus on integrating transit services throughout the county so that even though a, a customer may go from one service to another it is more seamless in the future than it is today. Another category is to recognize that our crystal ball, particularly if we decide to do a 40-year measure, is not perfect. So to come up with some way to do a periodic, let's say, 10-year review of the um, expenditure plan to make amendments. And the final one is a Vision Zero policy and a framework for that. And I'm done. Mr. Chair, I do have a question. Um, I understand, you know, Mr. Tatson saw me roll the eyes on the yeah. urban limit line. Um, and I know there is some conversation or, or just, I don't mind having the conversation, but the county feels very strongly that that cannot change. And I don't know how you get the county to support this if urban limit line changes. Um, there have been no uh, challenges to it. There have been no expansions of the urban limit line. And uh, with the housing problems that are coming up and what we're dealing with on a regional level, I just, I, I want to put it out there, you know, if, if if we want to have a conversation about it, but I can just let you know I'm looking at Mr. Glover, this is a no-go for us. It just is. But I wouldn't be reflecting our shareholder input if I didn't mention I it. And, and as you know, it took quite some time to get the last measure agreement, be, and that was because of the urban limit line, and we think that we have put something in place that is workable, that was agreed upon by all the communities but a couple who decided to go out and do their own urban limit line. As uh, my colleague has stated, we see that it's that it's working and it's in place. So, yeah, I, I, I just would remind people Measure J's five-year review. That's all. Yeah. It's. I mean, I don't know what the advantage is of ten. I, I don't even think we know we're doing five-year reviews. It's probably. Uh, 2021 is the next one. Uh, as far as the urban limit line, from what I've been told, there's some legislation in Sacramento might put an end to that anyway. So, and just a reminder that the sustainable community strategy calls for 100% of the growth 
inside the urban limit line and 85 or 80 inside PDA. So, I mean, let's let's take a look at everything that's on the table. I'm not going to kill the darn thing when I got two supervisors here, and we need four. So, I mean, this does this is a math problem at this point. But uh, if we're fighting for something, we're going to lose anyway. Let's know where we're at. My only comment would be none of the cities have done it without going for a whole lot more than 30 acres anyway, in which case they put it on the ballot and they sold it. So, yeah. and frankly, the folks who seem to have been objecting to it in the last measure seem to be working out deals with all the places that they um, mm -hmm. objected to in the first place, and they're benefiting by getting land from it. So, you know, I'm, I'm fine with leaving it alone. Right. So, right. if point of... Clarification, because if I don't do this, the old man will forget. There is one thing about this urban limit line that really bothers me, and that is San Ramon had an opportunity to get 230 acres of open space, and we couldn't do it because it violated Measure J. And that should be looked at. That's, that's just wrong. That one talk about. Okay. All right. a really unusual circumstance Are we, right there. Oh, okay. I've got to... Just, just a quick comment. I think in the yes. same vein is, it, I think it's important to remember that without an extension of a measure, the urban limit line r expires in 2034. I mean, when our measure, which is the return to source funding, is the is the is the incentive. So I think that's the other thing to think about. That if you know, if our urban limit pass. line expires in 2026. Okay, so that's 2026, and our. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Thanks. but the, the safeguard has been yeah. no return to no source. No return right? to source, so, and that's 34. Yeah, commissioners, one of the, did, did we talk about, there was one other issue that was brought up on labor. You, I mentioned it briefly. I said we've got groups working on some alternative language that we'll bring back. Okay, thank you. Right. So I want to thank you, Don. Yeah. And, and, you. and because, I'm just a spokesperson. Hey, with the money you're making, Give it's got to be incredible. Uh, uh, but the idea is, I think we're, are we due back here uh, for a proposed me meeting on June 12th? This is the, by the agenda we now see for our June 12th and 19th meetings, we're going to add the, okay. the duration issue that we continued from earlier in the discussion. Okay. And thank if you. I, if I could, Bob. Yeah, I, sure. I, just on the labor piece, uh, are we working on language? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to, because I was on the phone for a hour today on that one. So, okay. Mr. Taylor, um, I know there's no, uh, we don't have a board announcements, but I do, uh, would be remiss not to mention two things, uh, all related. Tomorrow, as all of you know, uh, is the memorial service for former Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher at 2 o'clock at the Lesher Center. In saying that, um, I would, I would like to ask staff to come back at some point uh, and, and properly noticed, but there has been a request uh, that the fourth board be named in uh, Ellen's honor. And um, I would like staff to come back with the concept of how we would go about that. And it, obviously there would have to be uh, agreement, but I thought this was the best place to bring that, uh, that request. Uh, it has been discussed amongst her family, and uh, that's what Ellen's wishes were. If it's appropriate, if, if it's possible. Commissioners, I, I actually do know how that process works. I used to work for Caltrans, so I will just say uh, <laughs> it's either an assembly concurrent resolution or a Senate concurrent resolution. So we need a state legislator to support that. And then we have to, if it's approved, we have to raise funds from a private perspective then to install those signs. I'm it's sure there'd be no problem with that. I just need 2,500 to 3,000. So we can work our state legislators to see which one would like to uh, propose that legislation. Well, it is in Senator Glazer's district and Assemblymember uh, Bauer can. Uh, I know we'll check in. And I know that Assemblymember Frazier is the chair of the Transportation Committee, so obviously we do not want to ruffle feathers. So hopefully it can be the entire Contra Costa delegation, but hopefully I would think that Senator Glazer would lead the way. And I don't know if, if um, it's not agendized. 
so at some point, could you come back with it on the yes, agenda so we can give you direction on what we'd like to do? We Thank can you. actually make that happen. We don't need an agenda item to, to ask those questions. Well, I don't we know what it my colleagues feel. Uh, we may need to take. Well, yeah. I, I, all right, we will bring it back as an agenda item. Thank you. Okay. And I want to thank everyone in the audience. Uh, I tried to get this thing by 9 o'clock. I was pushing. But but we did pretty good. And unfortunately, I don't know what happened to the game. Oh, it's unfortunate. So thank you all for your attendance and your patience. We're adjourned.